Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello kids and welcome to season three and episode number 339 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today recording day is Friday, March 15th, 2024. It's a beautiful day here at the Beaver Lodge. (laughs) <laughs> and we have got a great show planned for you today, kids and cubs. Very excited about this one. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we do anything else, let's say hello to you, Mr. Grizzly, and ask how is your mental health doing today, sir? Well, sir, uh, I think I'm okay. Uh, I just think I'm okay because I am not at all awake yet. <laughs> I slept in a little bit. Normally, you know, wake up at 5, crawl out of bed at 6, log on to the computer, start to write some stuff, put this together, get some ideas, send out the links, and I'm good to go. Uh, this morning, I didn't get out of bed till 6.30. <laughs> huh. And even then, I'm like, oh, God, I'm just so tired. Oh, my lovely wife is bringing me a cup of coffee. Oh, what an angel. (laughs) Oh, God, this is going to be so good. Just a second. Let me just. Oh, there we go. That's the nectar of life right there, my friends. I'll tell you that. That is what gives me a reason to stay alive every day. Coffee. Well, not really, but it helps. So, how are you, sir? How are you feeling? How uh, how was your night? How did you sleep? You, you, you look v- uh, full of piss and vinegar this morning. You look like you're full uh, of piss and vinegar. So I'm assuming am, you got a good night's sleep. I'm feeling good. Uh, I'm sorry if anybody was hearing some double there. There was something running in the background no, there we're for good. a minute. We're good. Okay, uh, I am I, I am doing well. I actually woke up uh, about five minutes before the alarm. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and bright and fresh as opposed to the last two mornings where I was sort of like, oh boy. That, yeah. that that alarm came quick. <laughs> well, yes, so, yeah, it was horrible migraine. So I was, you know, kind of quiet and just trying to do some stuff in the background today. No migraine. I'm just, I'm just not awake. <laughs> right. No, nope, no, nope, feeling absolutely great. Got a great night's sleep. Uh, all the good stuff. So uh, yeah, I am raring to go. And plus, well, I, I've been excited uh, because we have a guest joining us. Well, we have a couple of guests joining couple us, guests, but yes. we have. <laughs> but we do have a guest uh, joining us uh, that we had been looking forward to because we promised earlier in the week that we would make an effort to reach out to him, and we have, and he has agreed to show up uh, on our show. So uh, we will have that, and we will talk uh, a little bit about um, what it's like to be at a Pierre Polyev rally. Yes, yes. What, yes. Is, what it's like to attend a Pierre Polyev rally for someone yeah. who was there. Well, actually... What it's like to be at a Pierre Polyev rally if you happen to have something to say. And, and how much how much he lets you speak. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> the, the paragon of 
freedom of speech, free speech, free go make Canada the freest country in the world. Uh, no more gatekeepers, blah de blah de blah I don't like what you have to say. Get out of my rally. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, he's such a little shit given that little punk. Oh man, I hate that guy so much. I really do. I really cannot stand Pierre Polyev in any way, shape, or form. He's just a horrible human being. If, in yeah. case anybody didn't already know that, I'm just sharing that with you now. If, you, if you're learning this for the first time today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um, so why don't we just get into it? Yeah, that might uh, be the best thing to do at this moment. Our guest... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and for some reason, everything has just disappeared from my screen. For some I gathered reason, that. yeah, I gathered that. And I'm like, you're, yeah. you're you're kind of struggling a little bit, so there must be an issue. I, so yeah. I, I yeah. definitely am struggling for some reason. Um, happens, you know, it's not but our guest today um, is someone who has worked on climate change as a teacher, a researcher, and an advocate for over 30 years. With the last 14 of them with Greenpeace Canada. He has a PhD in political science and teaches a third year course on energy and environmental policy at the University of Toronto. We spoke about him earlier this week because he was at a Pia Podiev rally and seemed to have been escorted out rather unceremoniously. And from the images that we saw at the time, uh, it seemed that uh, police officers were involved, which made us wonder why it is that someone who appeared to have something to say but was not violent or threatening in any way needed to have police officers uh, put hands on him and why it is or how it is that the Conservative Party of Canada uh, has police officers participating in doing their security work. They had mounted police outside the uh, yes. venue as well. Yes, and why all of that was needed and how those arrangements were made, because that's a little, as the kids today would say, sus. So, yes, sus. yeah, it's this slightly sus. suspect, or, or is that what it means? When it's suspect I hear it. suspicious. Okay, okay. Yes. So, without any further ado, kids and cubs, please put your paws up and give a big round of applause for Mr. Keith Stewart. Welcome to the Beaver Lodge, good sir. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for joining us. It's lovely to have you on. Um, as we do for all our guests, uh, we also ask them, how's your mental health doing today? I'm just peachy today. Excellent. Got up nice and early, I've walked the dog, had my coffee. I'm good to go. I haven't good walked to go? my dog yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> Fridays we go on for a couple hours usually. I'm going to have to take her out mid-show at some point, I think, because she's starting to do that little... Uh, Daddy, I got to pee, Dan Sinos. <laughs> I'm familiar. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, Keith, um, tell us, before the incident started, what motivated you to want to attend the rally in the first place? Because uh, clearly it's not going to be a place where your people are going to be the most happy to see you. No, so... <clears throat> I kind of feel like Pierre Poly has been given a really a free ride. He gets to set the agenda. He gets to talk about the things he wants to talk about and doesn't talk about the things he doesn't want to talk about. Yeah. And I think he should have to say what his plan is for action on climate change. He's holding all these acts to tax rallies to say what he wouldn't do, but what would he do? Uh, so mm. I just grab. I only found out about this rally like late on Friday. Mm. So I just pop by the Greenpeace office. I grab one of our banners. It says, act on climate now. Um, oh, my God. That's so I, <laughs> I grabbed my 19-year-old son said, hey, want to come with me? Um, <laughs> he was into it. I think I think he actually thought it was more like it would be for him. I think it was like, oh, it's like a vi one of those video games I play. We're going to like sneak in. We're going to do a mission. <laughs> dun, <laughs> we ended up in the back dun. of the police van, which is perhaps more exciting than or police car probably perhaps more exciting than expected. Mm -hmm. um, but really, I just wanted to, every person who walked into that rally and on every chair, there was a sign, Axe Attacks. Right. And so I thought, hey, everyone's being invited to wave signs. So I didn't jump on the stage. I didn't yell anything. I just sort of moved to a clear area and like held up a sign that says, act on climate now. 
because yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be a terribly friendly crowd, but I do think actually there's people there who do care about their kids. They care about their community. They, some of them probably recognize climate change is a major problem. A lot of them, however, have, I mean, people have been lied to for decades yes. by oil companies, yes. by politicians. Uh, you probably, I think you guys saw my, my tweet that got 2,200 replies, most of which were um, telling me that climate change isn't real and wildfires yeah. are all yeah. started by environmentalists. Um, but, you know, I, I do think we, uh, we have to challenge Polyev on his own ground rather yes. than letting him, you know, pick all of his venues and choose whether or not he answers questions. So I wanted to go out there and try and raise this banner. Uh, and I got basically tackled. So um, it was, but it was interesting that, you know, this champion of free speech won't let you hold up an unapproved sign. Everyone got to hold up signs. Like it's not mm -hmm. like holding up a sign was not allowed. Everyone right. was, in fact, given a sign to hold up. But unless you hold up the approved sign, yeah. you were grabbed by private security, hauled off to the side like I was just trying to stay on my feet as the guy pulled me off, mm -hmm. and then passed to police and you know, taken out and put in the back of a police car and sort of say, okay, we're holding you for, uh, it was originally going to be mischief to property. And then they sort of like realized what had happened and the police were like, oh, this, I think they, they assumed that I, the police seemed to think that I must have done something like charge the stage or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cause when I explained that I only held up a sign and we actually showed them a little video of what happened, they were like, Oh, and we were, they were like, okay, you can go. Yeah. Um, although the police had to go back in and find my keys, which had been knocked out of my pocket. Mm. Is he, he, he tackled the, the security, uh, security person, I guess, kind of basically tackled you. Huh? Yeah. I just like, and I've, I've, into lots of events like this and normally you hold up a sign and they come over and say you know please leave yeah. um or often they'll sort of like give you as long if you're not like kind of like yelling they'll like give you they'll let you hold up the sign for a few moments and say okay you've had your you've got mm. to say your piece you've had your moment yeah um but uh yeah no like i just heard i like started to like hold up the sign and i just heard this oh no you don't and i get grabbed and sort of like hauled off um like sort of he was like picking me up and then dropping me down over like one step and then another and then another it was Ooh. like this uh well-practiced move um and i was kind of wishing i hadn't lost all that weight after the pandemic <laughs> so much time effort because it would have been a little harder for him if i was still at a few extra pounds the 145 pounds of me is not that difficult to move mm. um but uh yeah it was it was fascinating to watch you know like okay what does free speech mean at these types of events, you say what you're allowed to say. You chant what you you could chant "fuck Trudeau," and they'd be so your okay heart's with content. That. You could wear "fuck Trudeau" T-shirts, and you were like applauded for that. Um, say "act on climate change," you're gone, tossed out of the room, literally. Yeah. Hmm. The, well, Interesting. Well, the, and here here's the thing about this: it's like we have been saying how much of an absolute shit given Pierre Polyev is since we started this show, even before, long before he was leader. Uh, now that he's the LOL, lead, loyal opposition leader, and I do that intentionally. <laughs> no, no, he's the Lou, leader of the official opposition. No, he's the LOL. Okay. Sure loyal opposition Lou? leader. <laughs> I changed it intentionally <laughs> because we know, all know LOL means laughing out loud, and he's a joke. But the problem is he's a joke that if he ever ascends to the position of prime minister, we're in deep shit because this guy is a fascist dictator as evidence by what happened to Mr. Stewart here, holding up a simple sign that just says act on climate change. Not, not no, fuck Polyev, not, fuck Polyev. not, not, are no, you're burning no. us, not, not, nothing vulgar, nothing rude, uh, nothing outlandish, nothing false. Nothing threatening. Nothing threatening, just act on climate change. That's it. And what happened? You got tackled, escorted out, handed off to police. That seems like a, a little bit right out of the Goebbels fascist playbook, if you ask me. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not that smart. But it, it, it is definitely the last, the furthest thing from, from uh, non-gatekeeping free speech. That, that, that little shit Gibbon keeps going on. He's going to make us the freest country in the world. And he's going to get rid of the gatekeepers. And we're going to be free and freedom of speech. And again, uh, freedom of speech is not a thing in Canada. We have freedom of expression. And you were expressing your thoughts and feelings. And we're tackled and taken out of the game for doing so. So anybody, anywhere watching this, needs to know what Pierre Polyev government will look like. 
you just witnessed it and keith here was on the receiving end of it mm. uh, mr grizzly i think we have uh, a little bit of video that uh keith uh has shared with us shared with us yeah clip to you yeah yep yeah. i sent it to you by email oh by email okay i yep. was looking for it in the chat. Yes, uh, i believe it was your son who got uh, the video right keith yeah Okay. Uh, up until that moment, up until the, the time that you unfurled the banner, um, what was, because I'm, I'm sure you didn't just get in, the rally started two minutes in and then you got up. I'm sure you let it go for a little bit. Okay. What was it like? What, what was, was the mood like? like? What, what was, was being like? said? Opening was... speech, I think, by Melissa Lantzman. Um, oh, sorry, we sorry, missed the beginning of that. The beginning of that. I, I, there was an opening little speech, I think it was by Melissa Lantzman, who's deputy leader. Um, not absolutely certain on that because I didn't, couldn't actually get a really good look. Um, then there was actually a speech by Polyev's wife, which was actually, I mean, the thing is, it's a really good speech. Um, expressing empathy for people who are struggling and concerns. And uh, this is one of the things that drives me crazy is if the they're mentioning, oh, the carbon tax is going to drive up the cost of everything, but they forget the fact that there's a carbon tax rebate. Mm -hmm. So eighty percent, you know, like the unless you're in the top twenty percent of income, you get more money back than you pay in. So actually, having a carbon tax helps you with your groceries and everything else. Um, the other thing was there's this concern over, you know, like our kids, our future. But what they're completely ignoring is the impact of climate change is going to have. I mean, I don't want my son growing up in a world of unending climate disasters. And mm -hmm. we need to, that's why I'm saying we need to take action. Um, but the speeches actually are incredibly well crafted. They're emotional, oh, yes. they're, they connect. Um, Polyev, I mean, to be honest, his wife was better than Polyev. He's, she's a better speaker, I think. Mm -hmm. um, a personality. But he was, he was also pretty good. I mean, like, and it's clear, he, I mean, he's done this rally so many times. Like it's, it's a, uh, it's a routine he has down, but it's a good one. I mean, in terms of as political speeches go, it's a really good political mm. speech. Um, it just happens to be full of lies or strategic omissions, which are the same thing as lying. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then I sort of like, I waited till partway through the speech and then he was starting an ax the tax chant. And so that's when I went up. It's not like I was interrupting a, you know, major exposition of his mm. position. He was just, you know, getting everyone to cheer ax the tax. Um, so I just sort of stepped out into the, the little clear space there and held up the banner. I have the video here, ready to go. Let's, uh, right. let's just have a look. This is the, this is the incident for want of a better term. This is the incident. Let's just take a look. <laughs> So, um, yep, no yelling, no screaming, no resisting, no talking back, uh, no sassing, no nothing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, are you considering charges? No, I'm not planning to. Um, I actually, like, I think that would distract the attention from... <laughs> the, the main point, which is we need to have political debate. And I mean, I don't even know who the person was uh, who grabbed me. I never actually saw them because, as you saw, like I was grabbed from behind and hauled off. Um, but I 
you know, I'm hoping to, I'm talking to you guys, I've sort of written a little piece, I'm going to try and get published somewhere on this, because I do think Polyev should be challenged on climate change, but also on, you know, a commitment to free speech, which mm -hmm. isn't really, it's a commitment to him having, being able to say whatever he wants, or his supporters, um, but not necessarily uh, anyone who mm -hmm. disagrees with him. Yeah, you, you don't get, you don't get to well, as, as evidenced by every time he gets asked a question by an interviewer in a, in, a, in a scrum, he refuses to answer, sidesteps the question, and turns around and blames Justin Trudeau for all the faults of the world. And I'm like, it, like you said, he well-crafted speech, well-delivered, but full of lies and omissions. And I, I, we've been, you know, on this show, we've been talking about that for the last, oh, I don't know, forever since we started. <laughs> about how one of the big reasons we have this show, one of the big reasons we do this is because we are just so sick of the unanswered lies, the unanswered omissions, the unanswered, unanswered, omissions, uh, the unanswered garbage. Uh, garbage. And it's just, we, we get frustrated beyond all belief when it comes to things like this. And, and, you know, as evidenced by the fact that you just held up a simple sign, nothing offensive, nothing vulgar, nothing rude. And I mean, I'm an all opportunity like uh, <laughs> advocate. About last month, I was actually arrested in Christia Freeland's office for doing a little sit in there, calling for the Liberal government to hold firm on their climate policies because they're backtracking. Um, like on the things that they promise, follow through on those and then do new things like regulate the banks. But we would need pressure on the government as well. And, you know, like Christia Freeland is the, the finance minister, so she has a lot of decision making power. Um, but we also, I also don't think we can let opposition politicians off the hook either they need to be part of this and they need to be like i would think like you know if you're going to be responsible opposition which is an important role mm -hmm. in our system of yeah. government uh you also answer questions and address like to say what you would do about things not just why everything is someone else's fault there's always going to be a bit of that in politics but at some point you got to actually say what your plan is well this is this is right out of the trump playbook right i mean just <laughs> It, it, uh, it, it's disturbing to me that we've seen this for the last few years, but it, it's, it's really ramped up in the last little while that uh, they don't answer questions. They try and steer and change the narrative. It's like, so if you're going to do something different, what are you going to do? And they never seem to want to tell us. So, yeah. You're, and everybody has to be held to the, to the same standard, it, including the prime minister, his cabinet. If they lie... If they omit, if they lie by omission, if they're duplicitous, we're going to hold them to the same standard. You can't do that. We're not going to let you get away with it. We will hold everybody to that same standard. We'll put up a mirror and say, is this the person you want to look at in the morning and say, I'm okay to take on the day? Because you just lied to the Canadian public and you did it on our dime and we're not having it. Hmm. Yep, indeed, indeed. Um, so... You're at the rally. This happens. Uh, how long were you there before you stood up with your sign about? Uh, pro I mean, I was. It was probably there 45 minutes, 40 minutes or so before the rally actually started. Okay. Um, as the room filled, and probably I don't know about 20 minutes in. I'm not sure, but like it was well underway. Mm -hmm. I'd like heard most of his speech. And it was like that, like, you know, that axe attacks chanting bit where I was like, okay, I'm going to do this now. Um, so, but like, I got to hear most of his speech uh, and, you know, it's well, well-crafted piece of political theater, mm -hmm. which is, which is part of politics. Yes. Right. I mean, every party does that. That's, um, but it's, you know, what is the story you're telling? I think is important. And I think it's important for citizens of democracy to also be asking, okay, what kind of a story are our leaders telling us? Okay, so in the time that you were there, to, in your assessment, what was the story being told? The story being told was uh, everything wrong with your life right now is the fault of Justin Trudeau and the carbon tax. If we get rid of this, everything will go back. Uh, I wasn't actually there for the last line, which I sort of saw heard later, which was like, you know, like, we'll go back to that moment where we're all sitting on our porches with the Canadian flag yeah. fluttering behind us i'm like well you know not if it's like climate fueled extreme weather blowing your house down 
or like you know in, in newfoundland wa literally washing houses into the sea yes um it's you know it was scripted from start to finish um and it was designed to get people mad i mean that's one of the things that i find really frustrating with a lot of the politics right now is so much of it's about it's like this cultivation of anger so like you know like um i put out a tweet on this um which my tweets you know like if i get like a half dozen likes that's nice a really good one will get like you know 30 to 50. um this one got a thousand likes and retweets but it got 2200 replies and the anger in those mm -hmm. replies, and like in my direct messages which was you know i will not know because it's inappropriate for an audience <laughs> but um yeah. You know, like the, the anger that's there and part of it is some of this is just purely bots i mean i clearly there's a, there are a bunch of bots that are online and on wildfires in particular like i clearly triggered one which just sort of sends this slew of messages of oh it's arson it's not it has nothing to do with climate change it's just arson it's bad because i think a lot of us i would love to believe that the problem was like a few bad people mm -hmm. the fact that we need to like change the way our economy works that would be a much easier solution and you could oh there's bad people you punish them the problem goes away actually we need to change a lot of things about the way we live that's a much harder thing to do it it would be lovely if all we had to do was arrest a few people and the problem would go away but that's not how this works right but people are being told that you you know anyone who tries to tell you climate change is real has some kind of secret agenda they're liars they're probably the people who lit the fires like it's yeah it's this onslaught which i mean i originally missed your invite because i just stopped reading my reply <laughs> because you know you just kind of like you don't want to spend your whole day just scrolling people who are like screaming at you online yeah. um yeah. even though you know that half of them are at least aren't real right They're, you know it's like you know greg zero five seven four three two one like no kind picture. of yeah 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 there's yeah, tons exactly. of thoughts so there's two things that you mentioned there that uh two avenues i want to go down um when, in your opinion, as someone who has researched this type of thing, and based on what you know of the policy, if we did remove the carbon regulatory fee, would things go back to normal? Everything be fine? Would everybody be able to now afford their mortgage payments that have gone up 3.5% on their interest rate over the last little bit? Yeah. Um, so the carbon tax does have an impact. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very small on things like inflation. Like the calculation that's been done by the experts is, it's you know, 0.3% of food inflation is related to the carbon tax. But again, you get a rebate. So even yes. though you are paying a tax, you're getting a rebate back. It raises the costs of some things. But the the point there is to get you to do get other things as well. Um, and, you know, there's things like they've built in a higher rebate for rural communities because you know if you're in a rural community you're not taking transit you don't really right. have a choice um and we have to but we also see the thing is the carbon tax isn't the only answer either we have to do a whole bunch of other things like for instance build great public transit so you can take an electric bus rather than drive a gas-powered right. vehicle the the sort of like the requirement to phase out gas-powered vehicles the cleaning up the electricity grid like these are all part of a package mm -hmm. that are going to mean that you're actually you know in the long term your energy bills will go down because a lot of these things are actually cheaper. I'm um, like, if you get a heat pump, I'm trying to get a heat pump for my house. It's expensive up front, but I'm going to save a lot of money over time on my energy bills. Right. Um, which is why things like having it's like subsidies for heat pumps is a great idea. Right. And right. even more important, say banning in new construction, saying you can't put in gas fireplaces anymore. You actually have to start by putting in heat pumps. So people get those cost savings from the, from the beginning. Which, right. you know, here in Ontario, Doug Ford is actually going to pass a law to overrule the Ontario Energy Board, right. which said, oh, for, you know, we're just going to like shift the rules so that it makes more economic sense for a home, bu owner, home builder to put in a, a heat pump rather than a gas fireplace. Like these are the kinds of things which we need to be doing alongside the carbon tax. The carbon mm -hmm. tax is not the be all and end all. But if it was taken off, it's not going to make a huge difference on your bills. You're going to stop getting the rebate. Um, you're actually probably going to be worse off economically. Uh, it's it's so frustrating to me because I also read so much news coverage where they say, oh, the carbon tax is going up. They don't also say, oh, the carbon rebate is going up. Right. Um, yeah, they ignore that fact, right? Yeah, and it's, I'm not everyone. I mean, there's, and I mean, there's lots of great reporters out there, 
Um, but it's all, you know, I watched the coverage of that, the Pierre Polyev rally. And none of the TV coverage that I saw mentioned the fact that there was a rebate or that the rebate would be going up at the same time. So right. if you're just, you know, casually watching the news, it's like, oh, this must be bad. Taxes are going up. No one loves that. No, no one no. loves taxes, right? No. Like, but they actually are necessary. Um, right. And that's the role of responsible political leaders is to make that connection. It's like you, if you want nice things like schools, roads, hospitals, we actually have to pay for them. And so let's find a fair way to pay for them. And that, you know, to me means progressive taxes. And like, for instance, I think we should be talking about having a wealth tax in this country. Mm -hmm. um, because the if you're wealthy, you know, you pay, you don't pay the kind of income tax you used to. No, you don't. No. You know, back when income taxes were much higher. But also most of that, you know, income is actually, if you're rich, to avoid having income uh, by like, you can play these accounting games, which is why right. you should tax wealth because that's harder to hide. Um, right. But, uh, you know, these are all making the carbon tax go away is makes for a great soundbite. I mean, like I, I look at the, 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 the conservative platform where, you know, ax the tax, fix the budget, build the build homes. The homes. Stop um, like it's just the like, crime. Stop the Fire crime. the liar. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stop the crime like, is my okay. favorite out of all of them. Oh, okay. We, we've only you been mean, trying to stop crime since the beginning of humanity. Yeah, yeah, Let yeah. me know when you're successful yeah. with that, dude. No political leader yeah. ever in history. <laughs> no, I don't give a shit about crime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let the criminals run free. You know what we don't have in society? Enough criminals. Slogans is all he has. There's no no plan, no platform, and nothing to help anybody but the wealthy. I mean, let's face it. The, the carbon tax was designed by who? Do we have a drum roll? We do, do we have a drum roll? Uh, Stephen Harper. <laughs> I'll find a drum roll for later. I have it somewhere. I just can't remember where I saved it. Uh, Stephen Harper was the one who came up with the carbon tax. It was his idea. What They called it uh, greenhouse gas emissions tax, I believe. He also came, he up, also with came up with the luxury tax, luxury tax. for um, expensive trucks. You know, if you had a, a truck that was $120,000 or something like that, you were going to pay an extra tax on top of that, what they called it the gas guzzler tax or something like that. Mm -hmm. All this came under Harper, but suddenly Trudeau's the evil man who's taking all your money, which I, what do you say to that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the carbon carbon rate per, um, um, is it metric ton? No, no, just ton of uh, carbon right now at $65. It's going up to 80 uh, on April 1st, but at $65 right now is the rate at which Stephen Harper said it would eventually get to when he originally made the announcement. Yeah. So right now, what anybody is paying is no different than they would be paying if Stephen Harper were still prime minister right now. Yeah. Based I mean, on the, the, the challenge with that, I remember that, that when that climate plan came out from Stephen Harper and there was like no... It was funny because there was no opposition from the oil, like the oil industry. Yeah. Nope. Um, and it was partially because I think they thought, kind okay, of, well, I have to. He won't actually do this. He was just kind of floating it out there. But it's, I mean, the carbon tax. I mean, the crazy thing is, I have a, a I had a lot of economist friends. I did a bunch of economics courses. I like economists, but sometimes their their political sense is often not great because they're kind of like, well, conservatives like markets, so they must like a carbon tax. Um, because that would be consistent, yes. like intellectually consistent. It's like, well, no, actually, um, they uh, they basically want um, measures that entrench the power of existing elites, in this case, in particular, oil industry. Um, and if you try and, like, bring in a measure that's going to, like, challenge that, they will oppose it. Mm -hmm. um, and I always like to, I wish it wasn't under a, a paywall, but in 2019, the Globe and Mail actually had a really good piece on how there's actually a, a summit meeting between um, Andrew Shear's Conservative Party and the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers before the 2019 election, where they're basically like, how can we work together to defeat the Liberals? Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, you know, they had the agenda that was like all these things like here's the ways you can do it. Here's how you can use third parties to advance your agenda. Right. Um, you know, it's that. And uh, 
we're seeing that again right now. I think we're seeing, you know, like the the not so smart ones in the oil patch are actually like you know going on record with Reuters saying, oh no, we're just like we're not going to spend anything on cleaning up our operations because we think Polyev is going to win in 2025 and we won't have to do anything. Right. So we're just going to like make sure Trudeau loses and it'll all be good. Um, right. So that's you know that if they don't clean up their mess, what their hope it's that mess just doesn't go away. The ultimately yeah. will end up on the taxpayers if they don't do it. And so that's going to come out of our pockets. Um, so yeah. I think it's, you know, this we're in, in a way like a run up to an election. Hopefully it's not until 2025, <laughs> um, but uh, we need to start having these things talked about and stop giving conservatives uh a free ride in terms of what they will and will not talk about. Yeah. What you mentioned is that uh, something I call governments change, but we stay forever philosophy. So like, we just got to wait out the next government. I mean, China, that's what China was trying with us when the, they had, uh, when we had uh, Meng Wanzhou uh, in custody, it's, uh, you know, they were pressuring us and putting a whole bunch of detail, a whole bunch of stress and, you know, um, tariffs and other types of things on us, on canola and other things, except for pork, because they really needed it for their holiday celebrations. So for some reason, they didn't put any uh, on pork. But for anything else that they thought could damage us, they did. And then they were hoping that Trump again would win the next U.S. election and they didn't. They were hoping that Trudeau would lose the Canadian election, and he didn't. And then when he, they found out, oh, well, gee, for the next four years, we're going to have Trudeau and Biden, I guess, well, I guess we're going to make a deal and just stop all of that. And boom, all of a sudden, you know, the two Michaels were free and Meng Wanzhou was going home. Uh, but it really was. It was like, hey, let's just apply pressure and hope we get a change in government and then we'll have a government that's more amenable to what we want. We'll have a government that signed FIPA with us for 31 years back in back in place and maybe we'll be able to get our Meng Wanzhou back and uh, then we can go around our, our nation and say how pro uh, propaganda wise how we won we defeated big bad evil Canada who tried to interfere in our affairs and it well, didn't quite work that way so then they cut bait because they didn't want to wear that for another four years if I try have it to try to explain why it is she's not back yet or you know so it, it just became a safe face operation at that point um, but we see that often, you know, it's like, well, you know, we'll just slow roll this and drag our heels there and maybe we'll have another election. We'll get a change in government and then we won't have to do anything. And that's the, unfortunately, that is a, a tried and true political strategy that has worked often enough for to, to yeah. make it, it worth people to try that to put the money into dragging their heels instead because it all costs money anyway. If you're leading a if you're leaning a campaign to drag your heels, you're you're still using your lawyers for some things and you're still right. It's just to try and not rather than just make the change and flow with the river, trying to resist it all the way. But I mean it's corporations are paying for that for the lobbying and the legal representation and the hit to goodwill and all of that kind of stuff that goes into making sure that uh, you're dragging your heels. So it's <laughs> They're not afraid of spending money. It's just to what end. So that's uh, yeah. it's a little sad. Um, the other thing that you were mentioning was about uh, the accusations that environmentalists are starting the fires, are creating the arson. Um, now, just like when you say when they talk about the carbon tax, they never talk about the rebate when they say that that accusation there's still the inconvenient question and say okay well let's assume they're all arson why are they burning so big and so long yeah so i mean for a wildfire you need you need the right conditions so it has to be dry and hot basically and you need something that sort of ignites it and i mean the ignition source is generally lightning um, but if lightning hits, you know, a, a tree that's, or like a grass that's sort of green and full of, and kind of wet, damp, it fizzles. Mm -hmm. But we've had these incredible like heat waves and droughts so that when it's like tinder dry, and there's a difference between, you know, throwing your match uh, back in, I think we're all old enough to remember when we used to light barbecues and you had like the little briquettes yeah. and they weren't self-lighting. You couldn't like just 
you know, put a match to them and they would light, you had to like put on lighter fluid. <laughs> right. Accelerant. And, uh, like, yes. uh, or just in light. And like, it's like, this is, climate change is basically adding the lighting fluid so that when a lightning strikes or there is some kind of a ignition, whether it's, you know, a spark from a train or the tailpipe of an ATV, I mean, those things get really hot. Right, like the the mufflers and the tailpipes on them. You're driving through long grass. If the grass is nice and green and lush, nothing's going to happen. If it's tinder dry, you can actually start a fire that way. Um, so, like you know, some of the, even some of the things of arson aren't even like someone went out and deliberately set a fire. It's kind of like where they're human caused. Um, but it's partially because those conditions are there. But the vast majority of all this is lightning strikes, um, which is why you know they're happening in incredibly remote regions. It's not like you know we're parachuting in environmentalists into remote regions to like light fires and then run away. Um, but it's, but I do think it is fascinating to me, like how people really want to believe that. And mm -hmm. when leaders reinforce things, people want to believe particularly to get them angry so that they will donate money, mm -hmm. um, which is part of the, the whole anger machine. The goal is to like raise money. Um, and when you're feeding that kind of anger and division and not willing to actually talk about some of the real problems we face by preventing these like easy, simple solutions that aren't really solutions, um, that's bad for democracy. And I think we have to be calling it out. And I think it's the challenge increasingly is we're in, it's so easy to put people into little bubbles um, as to what they're seeing and hearing that it can be really hard to break through. And, you know, holding up a banner at a Polyev rally is kind of an attempt to do that. And I know a lot of people there were not happy about what I'm hoping, you know, if even like one tenth of them, I did that guy get hauled away for having that sign. Because again, I think like a lot of conservative voters, you know, there's people there who care about climate change and they're being fed this mm -hmm. easy answer. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, who's the villain here? The villain is actually the environmentalists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not, whereas, you know, we actually, there is no easy villain here. It's like, we got to change our energy system. And there's people who benefit from that system and who make, you know, record breaking profits in the oil patch the last couple of years, um, who want to keep that system going as long as possible. But for the public good, we actually have to change that. Um, right. While taking care of the workers in that area and those communities currently depending on oil and gas extraction, you know, that's why, you know, there's this, we had this plan for a just transition. And to me, the crazy thing was the Alberta government was actually running a petition which said, stop the energy transition. It was literally like, don't help oil and gas workers get ready for a post oil economy. Do right. not do that. Right. Um, just let them believe that it's going to be like this forever, that the party train will never stop. And then when the bottom falls out, oh, well, well, uh, that's capitalism. The Royal Bank. of That's Canada. what happened with the cod. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Handle that one. Well, we don't want to do that again with oil. The Royal Bank of Canada is divesting itself of, of uh, petroleum uh, investments. We, we read about this just a couple of days ago on the show, how they're like, that's it, we're, we're out of this. They're not the only company doing that or considering it. There are tons of large financial institutions that are divesting themselves of anything to do with fossil fuels. We're actually going to have a report out next week on Royal Bank's new climate policy, which... Uh, we say the logic of their policy is they should divest themselves, but they haven't actually said they're going to do that yet. Oh, so we're going to we're going to be pointing out that it's like okay, you said if your clients don't, if you know if you have clients who aren't ready for an energy transition, you will take that difficult step to move away from them. But they haven't quite defined who that is yet, and we're trying to say like okay, the logic of this is here's some companies that should be on that list. Um, but uh, I think it's you know the the fact that they're they've even been taken to that stage is really important because it's like it's and it's been public pressure that has really driven them there. But also, you know, there are these changes coming in the economy, and the question now is you know the energy transition, which is the shift off of fossil fuels, mm. it's happening. The only question is, does it happen fast enough to avoid the worst impacts of climate change? Right. Um, and how do we care for people through that transition? Right. And that's the conversation we need to be having. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a visual there that I have for you yeah, because you were talking about the banks there. Uh, it's from Saanich News and they were talking about a Quebec lender that's ending new mortgages in flood zones. So when we're talking on the show often about, you know, they want you to get mad for a 2.86 cent increase per 
metric uh, cubic uh, sorry cubic meter of gas but they don't want to get upset by the fact that your house insurance may have gone up 15 percent because of fires and floods because it was record payout years for insurance last year or they don't want you to get upset in this case that you can't even get a mortgage in certain areas now where there's a flood zone and it's like you know people are going like you may not believe in climate change but banks as you mentioned mr grizzly insurance companies and oil companies sure do and you know who else does the military yeah and all their intelligence through assessments reports and you know military preparation they're talking about you know what climate change can do and what you know what can happen when people in certain regions of the world no do any water at all or can't grow anything well, at yeah. all and yeah. unrest that can happen and all you know and mass migration and everything there already is tons of mass migration we've been talking about for about 10 or 12 years and a lot of people have been laughing but there is climate migration now it's not just economic or not just wards hey there's no water we can't grow anything here anymore we got to move well so these are all realities yeah. that are going to show up you know they're only going to amplify and become more common as the years go by and we're going to have to have some strategies to deal with it other than no it's not really happening yeah, yeah. The, the pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier what it does is it takes a bunch of existing threats and makes them worse um, and harder to deal with. And the Canadian military actually just had a paper out recently that I saw a story on last week, I think, um, saying basically the same thing, that the problem is, and often people are like, oh, this isn't only because of climate change. Oh, it's not only because of climate change, but climate change is a part of it, and it's making a bunch of existing problems a lot worse and much harder to deal with. Well, this this is a, let's, let's uh, we have another guest in the green room, and this is an individual who can... Uh, add some commentary to this because this is a retired military officer uh army chris our friend out in edmonton our, uh, we'll call him our uh, alberta correspondent <laughs> sir good morning oh man you ever walk into a conversation you feel like you're the stupidest person in it <laughs> constantly all the time, all the time. <laughs> like don't bring me in don't bring me in well i just thought you know we were talking about how the military has cited that climate change is a real threat and, absolutely it has to yeah and and this is you know climate you in, in climate impacts the whole geopolitical spectrum mm -hmm. right so yeah it's huge well, and can you can you tell because you worked in the oil patch for a while right I did. I left the military. military. Yeah, I went and worked for Suncor. So, uh, you've seen firsthand the amount of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, waste. Uh, the amount of like the tailing ponds, and I mean, you 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 can tell us from somebody who's been there, literally boots on the ground. Well, this both. is yeah. <laughs> it's again, you, you're getting into political painting here because, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not an advocate for Suncor because they fired me. That being said. <laughs> They are the first oil and gas company to successfully reclaim a tailings pond. Oh wow! When you drive past it when you drive on a Suncor base plant. It's 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 monumental. Like they showcase that you can reclaim mm -hmm. a tailings pond, and the job I did up there was was all infrastructure. It wasn't it wasn't process work. It was non process assets, and you can't do anything up there without going through an organization called Reclamation. Okay. For every one they tree you want to cut down, you better plant ten. No, it's, plant it's ten. No, it's, it's oh, there's a reverb. Oh, there. oh, oh, hang on, hang on. I got it. There you go. We're, we're getting a little so, bit of feedback from Keith in, so I'll, I'll just stay on top of it there. And I, I, I can't, I can't stand politics. I, I barely read the news these days. <laughs> it's, it's so polarized. You know, we're, we're just yeah. everybody wants to emulate the American model. Everything's too far left, too far right. Nobody's center anymore like they used to be, which is sad. But I, you know, and I'm not here to advocate oil and gas. I'm obviously living in an oil and gas based province. But what I can say that that gets ignored on the extreme left mm. is is the green policies, if you will, are very, very, very heavy in in all of these oil and gas companies. Suncor being the biggest one in Canada, and yeah, so if you didn't know that, hundred percent, they have successfully reclaimed a tailings pond. Did not. And know there's grass growing there. There's deer running around, and there's a big I don't know, I would call it a monument for lack of a better term. It's pretty early here. It's still the middle of the night for me, so bear with me. Um, yeah, it is yeah, two hours earlier. It's there. the thing, and, and you got to deal with reclamation or anything. There's, they're like, no, you can't do that there. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you can't build this here because it's nesting season. So right. during nesting season, you know, there's there's like a three month window. You can't do anything in these spaces. And this is, you know, they own that property. That's their property. But they they follow these rules and they they do their best. And I, you know, I get the impact that the oil and gas industry creates. I've seen the tailings ponds. I've seen the uh, the coke pits, which is a byproduct. These mountains of this black dust stuff that has no real value other than you can build roads out of it. They sell most of it to China, to be honest with you. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, I'm just rambling now. Help me out. his <laughs> <laughs> brother. Here, I'll bring uh, let's Keith, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take you off mute there, sir, if you wanted to discuss that. Because this, this, I did not know about this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. tailings ponds are a huge problem. They, they are. They're, they're the, horrible. The main thing is we, we, we don't know what to do with the water, and it keep they keep getting bigger. Like, so for the, the pond that Suncor um, reclaimed, I mean, pond they moved the water from that yep. pond... They, they they move the water from that pond into another pond. Like the water Correct. is kind of still there. There's over a trillion liters of the stuff, and we don't have a plan for kind of dealing with it. Um, which is the, the the terrifying thing there is. I mean, what it looks like to me is the company's plan for this is basically like they're going to run these operations out as long as they can. Then you shut down, you declare bankruptcy, and you leave the tailing ponds there for somebody else to deal with. Which is what the coal mines are, are all doing in around the world. Um, because companies are, you know, smart. If they can shift those costs back onto the taxpayer to deal with the problem at the end of life, because these tailings ponds are going to take decades to deal with, and we still don't quite know how we're going to do it. Um, but this is why you got to have the companies paying for these, for these things as they go, because they've got um, the liability regime in Alberta is one of the loosest in the world. In terms, of, they don't have to pay the money up front. Mm. The sort of the assumption is they'll pay for it over time, but once those assets reach the end of their life, which is when you sort of then start trying to clean everything up, the smart company basically hives them off, lets that portion of the company go bankrupt, and then the problem is left to, you know, we've seen this with the, the huge mine up in uh, yeah, well, North, nice. Northwest Territories. Yeah. I'm forgetting the name of it right the now. Giant mine. But that's the kind Excellent. of thing we need. We need to have those policies in place to make sure that you know, we don't get stuck with the bill at the end of the thing. These guys, these companies are making money hand over fist while laying off their workers. I mean, Suncor, one of the things they're really proud of is the fact that they automated all their big trucks so they don't have to pay drivers anymore. Correct. Um, <laughs> and yeah. that's the kind of thing. Like, Suncor is you know, not going bankrupt anytime soon, but no. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the, even if the, what the companies tend to do is well, as individual operations are reaching the end of life, you can look. So like what's happened to a bunch of the abandoned wells in, in Alberta is they get the, the well becomes abandoned. The company that owns them sells them off to some holding company based somewhere um, cheap. That company then, I don't know how they get money out of this deal, but they then like just declare bankruptcy and like leave the thing for the farmer to deal with. Um, mm. And the original company that did it said, oh, it's not ours anymore. We sold it. It's not our yeah, problem. It's, it's a shell game, right? Basically a financial shell game. Um, so it's, you know, this is where we got to have governments that are like on their toes and looking out for our interests. Um, because, you know, well, there's Canada, a neat idea. <laughs> <laughs> We're a major oil and gas producer. If the world is moving away from oil and gas the way I think it is, or even at half that speed, this is going to be a challenge for us. And we got to like, you got to prepare for that challenge and protect those communities, those workers as that happens, rather than just letting that hit us. And I think, I almost feel like, you know, when I look at Danielle Smith, it's kind of like she actually wants people to get hit so they'll be mad at her political opponents and yes. reelect her rather than saying, okay, how do we actually help people get ready for that new world? Because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah, if, our, if the way that our, our contracts are allowed to be written so that people don't have to take a portion of the profits that they make and set it aside in some type of trust, that, that goes to pay for the cleanup. And all they can do is just keep the asset on the books indefinitely until it becomes a problem. It says, oh, you know, we've squeezed all the lemon out of the, all the juice out of this lemon as possible. Now let's just slough this asset off to someone else and, you know, let them declare bankruptcy. That, yeah, that, that's, in, that's in nobody's interest. That just, like I said, just make sure that, to, you know, we're paying money to help with these projects at origin to help them get off the ground. And then we're providing subsidies throughout their entire life. And then in the case of Alberta, we're, um, well, not only Alberta, but we're, 
you know, there was another billion or a little more dollars supposed to go for the actual cleanup of these wells. And there was a report that just came out recently that said almost none of that money has actually gone to clean up any well. We've got, got absolutely nothing for it. Mm-hmm. And then the company goes bankrupt and then they're still there and we still have to clean it up. So we're basically paying for it three or four times over instead of just once. Well, that, that, that's the whole issue with orphan wells, which is different than abandoned wells, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, and who is it? Who has a lot of orphan wells right now is what Brett Wilson, who we all thought when we saw him on Dragon's Den was a nice fellow, but it turns out he's a little bit out there. <laughs> um, it, it, it strikes me as as. It, they're being alarmist. Uh, give you an example. Daniel Smith says, we're not moving away from oil anytime soon. I'm like, yeah, nobody said we were. Like, we're slowly trying to transition. Here's the thing. Even when, you know, when the day comes that all vehicles are electrified or hydrogen powered or solar or whatever. <laughs> once hey, that You can park your EV next to your unicorn pen. because that's. <laughs> but eventually it will happen. But here's the thing. Oil is never going to go away from our lives, period. No, that's what never. makes plastic. Half the exactly. shackle in the room right now is comes from that. So period. It, but I hospitals you know, can't operate without petroleum products. They cannot. I, and I agree with that. But I also agree you know, that they need some environmental accountability. Absolutely. And to get better. So it's it's the the hard left is we gotta get away from oil and gas and everybody's gonna have an electric car. Well, sorry, the grid can't handle it. Your lithium batteries for that car are $18,000. There are yeah. mountains of these batteries out in the desert in the United States that they don't know how to get rid of. Nobody oh, wants to talk actually, about that. Actually, Mr. Beaver can probably make a commentary about um, about car batteries, sir. Yes. Uh, my partner has been doing research. Uh, he got his PhD and he found a way to recycle uh, nearly 100% of the lithium out of an electric car battery with zero liquid or solid waste. Really? Yeah. yeah, and he's got, yeah, he's yeah. To, he's got trying to get a patent on it. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to get a patent on it because uh, apparently, uh, with uh, the projections that are uh, in place for how much we will need, how much lithium we will need for the car batteries that we will need for the demand for electric cars, there's not enough known mining deposits available to be able to fulfill that demand. So we have to be able to recycle the lithium out of the batteries that already exist in such a way that uh, the lithium recycled is pure enough that it could just be put into another battery. And it seems that he's found a way to do that. Which is monumental. Yes. Really, when you think about it, and for some reason event. he he can't get the article past the publisher <laughs> yet to actually get it published so people can act on it. He's been trying to write that article for four years now, and they keep on saying, "But what's the novelty on this? Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not obvious to you <laughs> because it's not being done anywhere." Um, but yes, I, I was reading this. Oh, I hope that gets legs. Oh yeah, me too. Because yeah. right? we need it. Like think of the fundamental shift in in our society with that, because all those, like you said, feels those, uh, those batteries would go back to the companies to be able to extract that lithium out of it, as well as the cobalt, nickel, and mag- um, manganese. Mag- manganese that yeah, are, like, that are get, also required. get to that. You got my attention, but right yeah. now it's like right now it's a, it's a great idea. Yeah, but an we, EV is not practical where where I live right now. No, no, no. Yeah. But I, like, so what I say is, and I want a Tesla. They go like shit, man. I rode one in uh, in Amsterdam, a taxi driver. That fucking thing gives her. I want that. Trust me, zero to sixty, like now. Yeah. But it is really or important. Keith, go ahead. Place the the recycling stuff now, so that we're not creating new problems in the future. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I also think there's a lot of really interesting. Like I, I think in ten years, not all the batteries are going to be lithium. There will be sulfur batteries, which are for applications yeah. where the weight doesn't matter as much. Mm-hmm. Um, there's going to be like a range of things. And if you look at what's happened, like so, solar power, the price dropped ninety percent over the last decade. Mm-hmm. Bat lithium ion batteries have actually dropped about the same, and the prices are still going down. It's partially like as you move from this kind of like niche innovation almost like handcrafted things to this mass production, the technology gets better, the prices go down. We're going to see this continue, but it is really important that we do get in place those recycling programs because then you actually don't have to mine 
everything, you know, one time and then throw it away, you actually keep using it. And the advantage is this stuff is pretty valuable. Um, so it's going to be, there's an incentive there to recycle it rather than just toss it. Exactly. Um, but it's, you know, like the, so the International Energy Agency, they've sort of mapped out a way we could get, reduce oil demand by 75% by 2050. Yeah. So it's not to zero, but it's getting there. And most of the stuff that's left is plasticky type stuff, which again, I also think we're going to be developing alternatives to over the next couple of decades. Oh yeah. So it's not going away tomorrow, no. but demand is going down. And once demand starts to drop, you know, prices go down fast. And that's where the oil companies, I think, can run into trouble. Um, and as Canadians, we need to like prepare for that because uh, it's no, it, I don't think it ever was, but it certainly is no longer a case where what's good for <coughs> oil is good for Canada. Um, we actually have to sort of pursue what's best for us, which is to make sure people have affordable energy that meets their needs so that they can get where they need to go. So their home is, you know, warm in the winter, cool in the summer. Um, but we can do that in a lot of ways. And that's the, the kind of thing we should be talking about to come back to like the, the Polyev rally. If you guys you're have gonna, like, rallies, throw people man. out for even raising the issue, uh, we're really not going to come up with those kinds of solutions. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Um, the article uh, that I was looking for, uh, I found it. It was uh, an Alberta senator who was trying to get answers about an orphan well cleanup in the province of Alberta and whether federal funding was being properly used to do so. So it was Senator Paula Simons, who cited a report from the Parliamentary Budget Officer released in January that shows that more than half a billion federal dollars for orphan and inactive well cleanup has gone to large energy companies. Quote, I asked the PBO whether asked any of that $556 million had gone to cleaning up actual orphaned wells, and I was informed by the parliamentary budget analyst that not one single orphan well in Alberta, not one, had been cleaned up with this grant money. The federal government had allocated $1.7 billion for the cleanup of inactive and orphan wells in 2020, with $1 billion going to Alberta. The money was being handed out through the province's site rehabilitation program in stages. The Orphan Well Association was also given $200 million loan at that time. The Parliamentary Budget Officer or Parliamentary Budget Office confirmed to CTV News that its analysts found that of the $1 billion in funding to Alberta, more than half had been given to large companies it considers to be viable. So at the time of the report, CNRL, Canadian Natural Resources Limited, had received $102 million. Synovus Energy received $12 million. Husky Energy was given 16, and Imperial Oil Resources Limited received 11.7 million. Those amounts are increasing as the province works through applications at different stages of um, the uh, site rehabilitation program. Quote, so now I'd like to ask, what exactly did we get for the $102.5 million we gave to CNRL or the $18 million we gave to Synovus, etc.? Simons asked. And to what are we actually going to do? Sorry, and what are we actually going to do to clean up the wells that are actually orphaned? The government representative in the Senate, Mark Gold, said that he'd make inquiries into Simon's questions. But in a statement, CNRL said that the federal funding helped the company and others reclaim inactive well sites and support job creation. Quote, Canadian Natural is committed to effective and efficient management of our liabilities and environmental footprint, including reducing the inventory of inactive wells through a robust program of well abandonment and progressive reclamation activities. For example, Canadian Natural abandoned 5,570 inactive wells in Western Canada from 2015 to 2020, in addition to over 3,000 inactive wells abandoned in 2021. And that's where the article ends, and it's make, it almost makes me seem that there should have been more to that article. And it, I don't know if it there was, and it just didn't get published or it got cut off, because that's a weird spot for that type of article to end, because there's actually not an answer. Maybe there'll be a part two. <laughs> this is really, I actually wrote them. I said, is, I actually wrote them and said, like, is that a, the entire article? Is there's because it just ends on a statement just about how many wells that CNR, but nothing about what they did. It was a dangling participle. Yeah. So it seems that they're when when they say that they're using the money to reclaim inactive well sites. What does that mean? Because that it just seems to me is like when I'm reading this, I'm hearing they're buying the sites back. Well, why would you buy the sites back? Aren't they already yours? I have no idea. Your Alberta correspondent has no clue. 
<laughs> I'm just I'm not sure what reclaim means in that in, in the in this in, in this instance. Well, it depends yeah. how they define reclaim. Right? Yeah. Re, when we in in the when I work in that industry, whether it's support to that industry or whatever, when you say reclaim, that means you're returning it to the state at what that it naturally was. So that's great. Now, how are you going to do that? Yeah. And and, and 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 who is the one who checks it off to say, yes, this is now reclaimed? Mm -hmm. No one can define that. So we're going in the big circle like that article. It doesn't really tell you anything. Yeah. Who's, hmm. the, who's, the, who's the governing body that says this is reclaimed and it's something they own? It's like having your company internally audit yourself and go, hey, we're good to go. Check in the box. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. we'll, we'll sell. One of the really, one of the really common things in Alberta, in particular, um, is companies. So the well stops producing, and once they sort of say it's we're done with it, they have they're sort of supposed to start cleaning it up. So what they often do is they simply never say we're we're done with it. We they'll sort of say like, oh, we're thinking about going back and maybe trying to get some more oil out of that well. So they never actually, the, the requirement to clean up never kicks in. Mm -hmm. So part of the backlog is because there's all these sort of wells which are inactive, but haven't been declared like, haven't gone to the status of now we have to clean them up. Um, and again, if you're a company, that's just smart, right? Like why would you kind of put liabilities onto your books to require this cleanup if you don't have to? Um, so the federal money that went to clean up for that, program you're talking about was during the pandemic and it was part of that whole like let's get let's get people back to work like let's just get people working get stuff done mm -hmm. um but it was supposed to come it came with a requirement that alberta kind of tighten up the polluter pay provisions of its uh oil well recover like cleanup requirements and alberta i mean they changed the rules but they didn't really tighten them up very much so it's kind of like then because the deal was the feds were going to give you them a lot of money, like it was a billion dollars or whatever mm -hmm. um, for cleanup. But Alberta had to sort of like tighten up the rules and close all these loopholes because there was a bunch of loopholes. Companies were using them. People had figured out companies were using them. It's a rational thing for companies to do. If, if you give them a tax loophole, for instance, they're going to use it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and I think the problem was we didn't actually like close all those loopholes. And there was a desire to get the money out so fast because of the pandemic that it was kind of like, here, we'll take this on faith. And to be honest, like the Alberta government just let the oil industry write the rules, which again, they're going to write rules with loopholes. Hmm. Which is why CNRL gives these kinds of vague answers because uh, there's all sorts of like little shell games going on behind the scenes of how you classify different wells and when, when it's, and to be honest, like I have lost track of how all that works. Um, it's the kind of thing like every once in a while I relearn it and then it's like fills up my brain and then eventually I have to empty that part of the brain for something else because it actually is incredibly complicated. Okay. I understand that. Right. Yeah, um, it's like politicians. If, <laughs> if we're talking about our, our overall uh, climate strategy to the moment, uh, um, I know that people like to talk about it in idealistic terms or what would be the perfect thing to do and how far off are we? I would like to talk about it more into what were things like prior to this current government, federal government, and what, are, what they are like now. Are we actually, under this government, making some right decisions and making some progress, taking steps in the correct direction better than let's say had we been maintaining the same direction that we were going on under the previous government has there actually been a net improvement of some kind keith i would say on climate change yes i mean the the, the harper government strategy was and harper actually the only time harper ever gave speeches which were kind of passionate was when he talked about canada as an energy superpower rooted in the tar sands um so their strategy oil. was oil sands, oil. not tar. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oil sands. Um, I'm old enough that it was tar sands. But, it was tar um, sands for me too. But yeah. Uh, the so and this government has brought in a bunch of policies, not as much as Greenpeace would like. There's a bunch more stuff we want them to do, but they have brought in a bunch of policies. 
Um, some of the key ones right now, they haven't actually like finalized the clean electricity regulations, the zero emissions vehicle standard, um, the oil and the cap on oil and gas emissions from the oil and gas sector. Those are all sort of like in the works. And we're one of the things like when I was at Minister Freeland's office last month, sort of saying, you guys need to actually get this job done because they're kind of like stalling on all of those because of the political pushback right. um, and watering them down. And we're saying, no, you actually have to like move forward on these things um, because they're the right thing to do. And actually also, I think overall, they're politically popular. Like people do want action on climate change. Um, so still not doing nearly as much as we need to, but you know, if you Harper to Trudeau, like it's a lot better. Um, and I mean, as I cited before, you know, you have a bunch of oil companies, oil CEOs telling, you know, Reuters news agency that, oh, yeah, we're just holding off on investing in any of the cleanup stuff because we're really hoping Polyev wins, um, mm -hmm. which is an indication of what would happen if that happened. And, you know, Polyev has actually been very clear. I had a piece in the Hamilton Spectator a couple months ago on like, um, you know, what is the conservative position on climate change? And it's basically to undo everything that the liberals have done but propose nothing in its place. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's how, and that's, that's why I really like, want to say, okay, like, what would you actually do? Don't just tell me what you're not going to do. What would you mm -hmm. actually do? Or are you, or are you admitting that you're going to do nothing, which is a decision to maximize suffering? Like a choice, choice to do nothing to address climate change is a choice to maximize suffering from the extreme weather, from floods, from wildfires, all those things that are affecting, you know, 160,000 Canadians driven from their homes last summer by a threat of wildfire. We don't want that to become the norm. Hmm. No, and and right now, uh, well, well, Chris was going to say something there. Yeah, so. go go ahead, Chris. Oh no, just it's Keith. I mean, let, let's be honest. No politician ever says what they're going to do. They just shit on the other guy. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's the Canadian model. Yeah, right. Like, but it's, it's our job it, to make sure that they start saying exactly. So we can't, I'm so tired of hearing because everybody assumes that I'm a I'm I'm a conservative. I am, but I'm not a PP fan. He's he's just the next idiot. Yeah, right. That's it. What are you going to do? Don't tell me what you're, what this guy is doing wrong. I know what he's doing wrong. I'm well aware. I'm living in that. <laughs> tell me what you're going to do, and then they can't. They can't do it. Yeah. So I agree. Not just on anything environmental, like fucking anything. Period. Yeah. Anyway, that was my banter. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 you're not you're not wrong there, sir. Because we we, we see the slogans from Polyev: build the homes. Axe the tax, spike the hike, stop the crime. Okay. What is axing the tax going to do? First of all, the, the problem with a carbon tax is the name of it. Yes. Stop giving these things names because you're, you're just d dividing the country. It's a fucking tax. We need taxes to build all infrastructure. Period. If you're going to put a fancy name on it, tell me what you're going to do with that money. Mm. If you're part of an organization, you have to deliver you know, a financial statement every year to that organization if you're a treasurer and it defines what you're doing. All I want to know is what are you doing with the money? So you guys were talking about the rebate earlier. I'm like, why are you giving me a rebate? Like either if you're going to take the money, keep it and do something with it, don't give it back to me. Like that, well, it, that makes no sense to me. The rebate is, uh, correct it's me to if make I'm it, wrong. It's to make it palatable. Well, that's part of it, but I think, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, gents, somebody who might know this better than I do, as I understand exactly. it. Exactly. I'm counting on Keith here to bail me out here because I don't <laughs> understand the point of this tax. Tell me where the money is going and show me a tangible result, and then don't give me the money back. Use well, as it I understand, for what he was rebate, intended for. The rebate that we get is from uh, the larger corporations that are paying a much larger fee. Uh, it, and it's again, we call it a carbon tax. The, the Supreme Court of Canada said it's not. It's ca a carbon regulatory recovery fee. But calling it oh a carbon God. tax makes it simple. But here's the yeah. thing the, the rebate we get is from the big companies that are paying much more into it, as I understand. Now, I could be way wrong on that. Uh, I don't Beaver know. Or, or Keith, if you can, you can address that. Somebody please. smarter yeah. than me answer that. I just want to know what they do with the money. Don't give it yeah. back to me. Go do something with it and then show me a, a result. A tangible result of what that money was used for and i'm happy yeah i, I like getting money back from you can the do it different Everybody ways does. um so like in ontario this 
I live in Ontario. So in Ontario, before Doug Ford killed the cap and trade, uh, cap and trade system here, which we sued him over, um, like the, there was a requirement in the legislation that all of the money raised through that had to be spent on measures to reduce climate change. So it was, you know, buying electric buses and doing that kind of stuff, um, paying for transit, paying for other measures. Uh, the reason you get a rebate is to try and make it politically palatable. You're absolutely right on that, Chris. Like it's like it was the, the and the goal was because the way the system works is everyone gets the same amount of money back. So if you can reduce the amount of uh, carbon, you like the basically the amount you pay because you buy less gas or something like that, because you get a more efficient vehicle or you switch your home to a, a heat pump. Like the, the, the idea is you get to keep more. So you still have an incentive to try and avoid the tax. Um, but the the money from the comes back is the, there's a separate industrial system for the really big polluters. That money doesn't come into the this rebate system. It's the fact that you have a bunch of companies that also buy gasoline at the, at the pump. So the total amount is not just the amount like individuals pay, but you know, company fleet pay by um, gas at the pump and then they have to pay the tax. And so there's a little bit more there. So some of that money, not all of it is rolled into it and is rebated to individuals, to households. So like, you know, to be honest, like my family, we make a killing on the carbon tax. Uh, <laughs> the rebate is so much more than what we end up paying. Um, but it's, uh, like the goal was to make it politically palatable, but the liberals have really fumbled the communications on this. They, they finally renamed the thing. So it's no, cause it used to be, no one could, no one understood the system. And so if you're trying to, trying to like give people, tell people support this because we're giving you money back and no one understands that they're getting money back or how, um, it's not actually doing that job. Uh, so it's, you know, that was a compromise to try and make it more popular and I think the liberals have fumbled the communications on it, but also it doesn't help when you have people regularly lying about it. Well, this um, is the problem. Like just, you, you could have avoided all this shit by just saying, or not putting a name on it. You're not, you're not creating a reason for people to argue. Just taxes go up naturally, right? Based, based on the, the economy. And then just say we're out in the budget allocating X amount to, to whatever for, for environmental. Just do that. Why, why do you got to put a fancy name on it and then piss people off? Is the That's what's going on. Because mm -hmm. you need to break this down to layman's terms for my, like to, to the level that I process this at. It's like you're, you're, everybody's up in arms, ax the tax. I'm like, you don't, taxes don't get axed. If PP gets in, I can't pronounce his name. He's just the next idiot to me. He's not going to get rid of it. No government will ever get rid of a tax. That is friggin' mythology. No. I, 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 just I, said I just wanted to say good morning. Keith, it's really nice to meet you. And, uh, nice to meet you. Army Chris, thanks for a great conversation last night. I'm just catching up a bit. and. Um, oh, all good. I'm allowed to take the chair for a few minutes because uh, Paul's taking... You need to, because I have no idea what I'm talking about. If you, if somebody would, have, if anybody out here said, Chris, hey, are you going to get up at 4.30 in the morning to talk about the environment? I'm like, no. <laughs> like, I, I hate but the here, earth. Why would I do are. that? <laughs> Fuck you, Mother Nature. I'm Fuck like, you. do you guys want to talk about guns for a little while? Or, you know, something? I, I actually would. Because, you no. know, you and I had a good conversation about that last night. We did, but we got Keith on. He doesn't look like a gun guy to me. No, well, I mean, there's a lot of... I got no problem. I mean, this mm. is where... I believe in gun control. Yeah, I, th I think you need rules. I mean, again, like, it kind of like... I, again, I live in downtown Toronto. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, you probably don't need a gun. The gun issue here is a little different than it is in northern Alberta. Exactly. And I, I'm, no. not to, I don't want to shift fire from the... Well, actually, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody thinks... Okay, you look at me. He's... Uh, uh, Ex-military, white male, wears camouflage ball hats, drives a pickup truck, and lives in Alberta, so he must be a gun nut. I have lots of guns, but I know how to use them. I don't think everybody needs a gun. Well, you, right, I'll like tell you, you why. Yeah, you, you take some two-day stupid course, and suddenly you're a gun expert? No. No. 
No, you have to be. No, I mean, be, I've I, shot a rifle I once. I shot a rifle once. And I was not trained yeah. properly. I was at a farm in Ireland, and it was like a very old gun. And I shot at some cans, but the first time I how'd you I, make out? I shot the can. Perfect. But uh, and it was like it was fun. But I also the first time I shot it, like I wasn't ready for the kickback, and I dropped the gun. <laughs> I dropped a loaded gun, and that Ooh, is not, not safe. Like I was just like, honestly, I never need to do that again. Um, but uh, I have. I have opinions. I don't know if anyone wants to hear them. I'm going to tell them anyway. But uh, like I, you know, I've lived in rural settings. I've been fortunate to work with a lot of indigenous communities as well and mm -hmm. hunters and, and hunters and gatherers and I think Inuit marine monitoring folks who, who uh, are doing uh, work across the Arctic and they can't go out on the land without a gun, without guns. Like they're sleeping in shacks that polar bears can just be like, Boop, and they're and the polar bears are in and like eating your face, right? So they need guns. Yeah, I've and, been up there, right? And so it's complex. It's like you, and so the new firearms legislation from uh, the federal firearms legislation was ham fisted. It was like they were going to ban all these guns that hunters need, like and no, they they shit the bed know? on that. They they try they fixed they've tried to fix it and I'm I'm fortunate to be part of a, a little bit of a part a very tiny part of it, but uh, I'm like I don't want a gun I don't I believe in gun safety I believe in gun control, but it's also in this country, um, you know we don't we don't have one size fits all legislation, and you know yeah if you if you're in the Arctic and you need a gun, you need to, you know. Be properly trained and well i agree it's just it got out of hand because again um i know you guys like to shit on pp all the time i just want to shit on trudeau for two minutes just for right right i hate them all i hate them all so so where's that reverb coming where's from? That reverb coming from i think does somebody maybe have a speaker on not me you can't tell sorry not me um the AR-15 was was banned because it's evil. You know how many uh, deaths in Canada over years from an AR-15 are? Anybody have an idea? Nope, not at all. Zero. <laughs> my my issue with Trudeau is every, he 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 takes U.S. issues and then makes them Canadian issues that aren't issues, right? Hmm. So. As soon as there was the last, I mean, there's a mass shooting in the States fucking every week. Uh, I think it was the one in Texas. Right after that, he's like, we have to ban all these guns. Like, why? Like, why, why do you have to do that? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of, I'm going to go, I'm going to come at you a little bit, Army Chris. Oh, well, you know, go ahead. It comes with, uh, with mad respect for you. Um, but. One of the issues, and I'm not, I don't know about the weapon that you were talking about, but, uh, but um, there's a, guns are also related to gender-based violence. And um, there are, re like, the the mass shooting um, in, uh, you know, the one in our neck of the woods. Yeah. Um, and the one out east. And anyway, I'm not explaining it very well, but yeah. Guns are connected to gender-based violence, and uh, and it's it's something that needs to be looked at. So it's not it's just there's no one simple answer, right? Oh, I don't disagree with you, but my Hunting, my concern is this: it's is criminals violence. don't care. Yeah, these these gun rules. Oh yeah, I'm with you on they, that. They punish responsible gun owners. Mm -hmm. Not criminals don't care. Here's the problem: if you look at how much money the federal government is going to spend on the buyback program. It's more money than they've allocated to uh, Canadian Border Services and the RCMP well, to stop cross-border gun, yeah, that's, gun smuggling. That dude out there, in uh, Nova Scotia <laughs> that had the cop car and everything, yeah, not one of those guys' guns was legal, and they all came mm -hmm. out of the States. Like, if you want to solve a problem, whether it's climate or guns, like, come up with something that's actually going to work, well, that I, solves the root cause of the problem. I have Not some. Good, we're gonna we're gonna ban mm -hmm. all these guns. Oh, that's really great. 
Because because the, the criminals using them give a shit if you ban them. No. Hugh, Hugh, I'm with you. Thank you for that. But and I have some good friends who work for CBSA who are frontline, and uh, and my gosh, what they put up with, and they are so underfunded. And you yep. know, one of my really good friends, he like when we started hanging out, he's like. You know, I was at his house. He's like, just so you know, I have, I have, um, I wear a gun to work every day, and I also have my own guns. But he is so well trained, absolutely safe. Like he's I, I got his, in training. His, his ammo is in a safe, and you know, he takes it when we went to hang out at his cottage, and he's yep. like, you know, like everything was done so properly. But in terms of his work, I mean, the, the. The underfunding is, uh, I'm with you. Like, it's it's like, the, yeah, okay, I, I support the buyback program. I didn't know how much it costs, but. Um, oh, it'll be three times what they said it costs. Mm -hmm. But Look yeah, at like. The, remember the, gun, the long gun registry? What that ended up being? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was exorbitantly higher. Because mm -hmm. I know how much money they're offering on an average per weapon, how times 300,000 that are out there. Okay. And what, you, what are you going to do with them all? You're going to send them to Ukraine? You're going to melt them down? It's all the administrative fees, all the people that process everything. There's, it's, there's multipliers of costs here that are not the Canadian public are not aware of. Now, just let me go backwards because I sound like the gun nut. No, I don't, don't think people need AR-15s either because they're, they don't know how to use them. And why do you need that? What are you going to do with that? Yeah. Zombie apocalypse? Maybe. Do I? I have an AR-15. I can't use it anymore. And to be honest with you, I never did use it. I bought it. It's, it's been fired. Five rounds went through the thing, and that's it. Listen, but if there's a zombie apocalypse, I'm this. coming to your house. <laughs> Sorry. And then you got these crazy guys that have like 90. Like, why do you need that? Many? That dude down in the states that shot up the concert in Vegas, mm -hmm. he had like a hundred AR-15 assault rifles. Oh, I don't know. Maybe there should be some checks and balances on why a guy's buying a hundred guns. Yeah, I remember the first time I went to Chicago and I drove into town and um, I started hearing this bang, 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 bang. And I was like, uh, you Ooh, know, Chicago is a dangerous city. It is. And anyway, it turned out it was just um, quarter sticks of dynamite that people were lighting off for some stuff. Oh, that sounds like America right there. <laughs> America. But I'm like, I'm going to die here. And I did get a, I did get, uh, I was in a, a um, an incident that fortunately did not get violent, but I was like, I was uh, accosted on the street. In Chicago? Mm -hmm. and, uh, you got to get a taser. That's what people need. I think. Right? I just, Clean energy, I, man. It's electric. I think I just need a good Tasers. throat punch. Throat punches are good. Hey, you know, yeah. Neil Young is coming to Edmonton. Can you believe that? Like, why would he come here? People hate him. Really? He's really? anti oil stands and all that stuff. Keith, what do you think Neil Young's footprint is for every time he does a, his carbon footprint to do a concert? He's actually like super responsible on this stuff and like sources all of his things. He's is actually he really? like, he walks his talk. Oh, yeah. No, he's okay. Like, no, if he does, that's part. cool. Cause like, I just, I find guys like, you know, DiCaprio and all these other people. I know what your carbon footprint's a lot bigger than you're claiming. Like, so if you, if you say that, I believe you. Because you're some Wait, no, shit. Neil like Young that. is grumpy, but he is like follows through on his like uh, positions. Like, I even if even if I'm like on the other side of the fence, I appreciate people who are not full of shit. If he walks, the, you know, walks the walk, cool. Got it. Mm. I respect that. It's guys that come out and and do, do this to make some noise and, and, and create some controversy on Twitter or whatever that are not living that way. They're, they're, like yeah. they're talking shit. That's what I can't stand. Yeah. I'd like to take up on that because mm -hmm. one of the criticisms that Pierre Polyev often has of the prime minister is by virtue of the fact of doing his job of being prime minister, he needs to travel stuff places. And yeah, he does. He's representing his use of having to be able to, for example, get to Europe to go to a G7 a conference or to go to the Queen's funeral or something like that, which, you know, if the Prime Minister didn't go to the Queen's funeral, well, then you'd have all the people from the CBC going, you know, like, what about our institutions? What about our tradition? What about that? Like, we're such an embarrassment, we can't even afford to go. But Correct. then if you go, it's like, oh my God, well, how much GHGs did you use on that plane? Um, could you Give us your opinion on why, why that this might be a particularly disingenuous argument when it comes to, for example, 
the prime minister specifically, who has a specific job to do. Yeah, so I would say we all should try and fly less. Um, I know I've stopped flying unless it's really important for like, you know, I fly for like weddings and funerals, basically. Um, I'll to actually tell Alberta because most of my family's out in Alberta. Um, including my one of my nephews who's former military who now works in disaster relief stuff. I think you, Chris, you'd get along great with him. Oh, right uh, on. But um, the, obviously like, we need to change systems so that people can do the right thing rather than like asking everyone to be pure. And what I find is a lot of the attacks people make on someone for being, you know, like not because, you know, I'll, anytime I am doing stuff, I'll often have people say like, you know, well, do you use fossil fuels in your life? If you do, then you should just shut up. And the point is we need to change those systems so people it's easy for people to make the right choice so they can actually like live a good life without undermining the ecological basis of that life <laughs> and so for like things like flying we should all try and do less of it for certain types of jobs you know you're going to have to fly i think like there is an expectation of our politicians if you're going to like represent a country like canada as the, the prime minister you're expected to like not just sit in ottawa you're supposed to go out to different parts of the country so that's normal you know like and i would say so what we would you know i'd say like okay like if you're going a short distance take the train or a bus um so you know like if i go to ottawa to see my sister or go for meetings or to montreal for meetings because we have a bunch of colleagues in montreal i'll take the train um but the that desire i often find the attack on people for you know individual decisions is a way to just try and send a message that don't even bother trying to do better because you're not going to be perfect and unless you're perfect there's no point in trying to like be better hmm. and i think we always have to try to be better but also build systems so that it's easier for everyone to be better it shouldn't have to be a massive amount of work hmm. um, to do those things so like I, I have never actually owned a car because only because I have lived in cities which have transit and I can bike everywhere and it's how I actually like try and stay healthy. Um, but I have an auto share membership. Mm -hmm. You know, when I went to the Pierre Pelliev rally, which was way out by the airport and there was no way to get there on transit on a Sunday, I like took an auto share car, which you can rent by an hour. Um, and I try, you know, like I, so, and if I, if I'm gonna go to like Ikea and get something, that I can't carry home on the bus. I'm going to like rent a car. Like it's like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to minimize. And sometimes I could even get an auto share car that is a hybrid and eventually they will be electric and that'll be better. Um, and that's great if rather, you live in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. That's not going to, that's not going to work. No. In a lot of places in this country. No. Um, and not which is one of the reasons like, why you have the climate rebate. Yeah. And we should, but we shouldn't be shaming people for making decisions because they don't have a better option. I right? We agreed. need to make sure we have those better options and everyone trying to do better is not something that like, cause uh, it's amazing how much you get it. I see people getting attacked for hypocrisy for, you know, doing something which they say they want to like, you know, save the climate, but then they do something which adds fossil fuels. This is part of the world we live in. You know, I'm sure back in the days of opposing slavery, the abolitionists were told you should walk naked because your clothes were made by cotton from cotton, yeah. you know, yeah. made by slaves. So uh, it's like, no, you can actually try and change a system while living within it in an imperfect world. That's how, that's part of being human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I could see that. Absolutely. Um, we're getting ready for an election, hopefully in 2025. Um, oh, God. If, <laughs> because, great. Um, <laughs> if a party wanted to seriously present uh, some environmental credentials, some climate, and maybe not just only climate change, but in general environmental, because there's more to taking care and being good stewards of the environment than just reducing GHG emissions. Um, what are some essential elements that you believe should be uh, present in the platforms? So I would say we need to have solid policies which are going to help people use less fossil fuel. So transition off so that that's the default option. So example, you know, new homes getting built should have heat pumps built into them, should be super efficient and should be prepared to deal with extreme weather. 
Mark Carney, who's a guy I don't always agree with, but he has a uh, piece in this morning's Globe and Mail on that exact topic. We should be able to have affordable homes and that also are good for climate. That's actually the kind of thing which public policy can do. Um, we need to clean up our electricity system. We need to sort of bring in those rules that will transition our vehicle fleet over to electric vehicles while also building the infrastructure so that people can actually charge those vehicles, et cetera. Um, one of the big things I'm working on right now is actually we need to start regulating banks the way we do tailpipes and um, smokestacks. We need to sort of get the banks to start shifting because they're, you know, the, the money, money flowing through the banks is bigger than the government. They're like right. huge. Can it, can it big five banks have given it over $1 trillion to fossil fuel companies since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed? We need to sort of start ramping down those the money going to fossil fuels, ramping up those investments in renewables. That's part of what RBC, RBC said they were going to increase their renewables uh, portfolio. But we actually need kind of rules on that because asking the banks to do it out of the goodness of their heart is not a terribly successful strategy. Um, again, I just saw a piece this morning on the banks getting caught once again, sort of like upselling people and misleading marketing um, on someone went in with like a hidden camera. Um, that's why you know we need rules for these types of things so that the big and particularly when we make big infrastructure investments it's got to be green because those are the kinds that shift um huge parts of our economy so rather than expecting everyone to sort of do it all through their being a green green consumer we actually have to make it so that everyone's a green consumer by default and for that you know there's there's a you know a whole there's like a million different things we need to do but like in terms of it's like shifting as much to electricity as possible electrification build out that a green grid um we need to make everything more efficient so we're using less energy to do the things we need to do like there's like a suite of policies that are all out there and that's what we need to be talking about rather than axe attacks i think okay um the other question that just popped into my mind because uh it was big news for a while and then it kind of disappeared um but the premier of alberta had put a moratorium on a new uh, on green energy and clean energy, cleaner energy projects for a certain number of months uh, to try to come up with new rules and regulations, allegedly having to do with reclaiming that land. I believe those rules were recently announced, were they not? So the yeah, that's what I was wondering. That there would be rules, but they aren't clear on what those are. Um, there, so for instance, like one of them was you can't be within, you can't build. The stuff within 35 kilometers of a site of like scenic beauty which is like okay who gets to decide what that is um that the the thing here is like renewables are facing these like really strong restrictions in alberta there was a moratorium now it's and a lot of the renewables developers are like we don't know still don't know what the rules are so we're not going to like invest anything but none of those same rules are being applied to the oil and gas sector um which having a wind a solar panels on your property or an oil well, only one of those can contaminate your groundwater. And, right. you know, and what's fascinating is the government got a report back in January from the Alberta Utilities Commission, like the the, the agency that runs the electrical system. Right. Um, they refused to release it before they brought out these rules. They bring out these rules. And then it just got released yesterday. And the AU, like the, the regulator said, actually, there isn't a big problem on sort of conflict between agriculture and renewable energy. These actually work pretty well together. It's even at, even if you imagine the worst possible case, it's like affecting less than 1% of agricultural land. And it's in a way that doesn't cause long-term harms. Um, and they basically, you know, there's not, there's not a real big problem here. So, you know, like we could clarify the rules, but it's not really needed or it's not, a, it's not a huge crisis compared to like, you know, the, hundreds of billions in liabilities for the oil and gas sector. Sorry, I don't think they said that part. I'm adding that editorially. Um, so the government basically brought in a politically motivated moratorium. They ignored the advice of their experts. Um, and it's all to basically preserve market share for natural gas. That's what this is really about. Um, and if you look at the, you, the uh, United Conservative Party in Alberta, their main financial backers are the players in the sort of small and medium sized natural gas companies. Those are the people who brought Daniel Smith to the premiership and uh, she's giving them the reward for their loyalty. Hmm. Interesting. So 
she promised new rules in about seven months that would allow the industry to get back on hand. But essentially, we don't have rules that are clear enough to allow the industry to get started again. So basically, um, it's a, this moratorium is essentially still on for all intents and purposes. Yeah, they're, they're choking back the investment. Because... Um, hmm. And they say, oh, so now they're saying, oh, we'll, we'll bring out a map of where you can build it and where not. But it's the kind of thing like, okay, that would be the kind of thing you would normally announce with a policy, <laughs> you know, rather than saying, we'll get back to you later on, you know, where this actually applies. Huh. Interesting. That's really weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have an entire section of industry that Alberta was essentially leading in. And she's just making a decision to abandon it and leave it without the clarity that the oil sector is actually, an energy sector in general, is actually asking and requesting and demanding so that they know. Because I know that there's a lot of demand from traditional uh, oil companies to have clarity on the rules so that they know like for the next 10 years what's going yeah. on so they know where to invest and what to invest in hopefully not have the rug pulled out from them every second or third year but i'm guessing green energy suppliers would like those that same type of clarity and it seems that they are deliberately not being given it would that be your yeah. assessment yeah this is an attempt to choke back that industry it's clear like and it's tens of billions of dollars of potential investment that is either on hold or gone. Yeah. So I'm seeing this. I have an article from the Narwhal here, and it says exactly what you said. Yeah. yeah. So the government plans to establish 35 kilometer buffer zones around protected areas and other pristine viewscapes, quote unquote, that will prevent wind farms from being developed, which could impact the majority of land in Alberta. Other renewable projects within those buffers could be subject to, quote, visual impact assessments. Speaking to the media on Wednesday, uh, spokesperson said there's un no universal definition of what constitute a pristine viewscape, but generally refers to, quote, areas that are unobstructed natural landscapes. Yeah, that's pretty that's big. clear. I mean, you talk to anybody in Alberta, everything there is scenic. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Alberta, Alberta, listen, climate, Alberta is going to burn this summer. Oh, yeah. No, that, but uh, in terms of like, you know, like, is Alberta beautiful? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We just yeah. talked about the renewable rules where they say you can't build within 35 kilometers of a something scenic. Yeah. What yeah, if I do find that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, the that's, that's the question that, that hasn't that been mean? answered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have this guy named uh, Jordan Dye, who's the executive director of the Business Renewable Center of Canada, who basically said, I think we will start to see the major impacts once we get the rules announced, although I like to highlight that regulatory approval for rene renewable projects took on average six months in the time before the moratorium. So at a minimum, the moratorium itself doubled the time for the regulatory portion of all these projects. While details are needed across all categories, particularly concerning is the continued vagueness of the viewscapes requirements. Taken at face value, an unprecedented 35-kilometer buffer zone around all protected areas would eliminate 76% of southern Alberta and would create a backdoor land ban. Any project that's even close to a protected area or what might be considered a protected area can't move forward until there's certainty from the provincial government. Dye called the new rules a second, quote, soft moratorium due to the uncertainty and extent of the changes. The new rules will apply to all projects approved after March 1st. There are currently 26 projects working towards regulatory approval. Uh, yeah. <sighs> what does that mean? It, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're full of shit. Exactly. Out here anyway. We're full <laughs> of shit. El Listen, Alberta's full of shit. The city of Edmonton's full of shit. I take out my blue bin with my recycling, right? You got to separate it. Different vehicle picks it up. Yeah, you know where yeah, it goes? Yeah. It goes to the same fucking landfill. It does. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about a waste of money and 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 complete wow. bullshit. That's what happens here. Well it's and, and it's ridiculous. I've seen um so I've I've friends who work in different areas and in different industries and in different organizations throughout this city. And I have visited, and I'm not gonna name the institution, but large institutions that have out 
the green bin, the blue bin, one's for metal, yeah. one's for paper, one's for plastic, and one the green is usually for organic waste, right? Food or whatever have you. Yep, we got and, that here. And I've been to these big uh, organizations and working with individuals in those organizations, and I see all of those bins, it's merely window dressing because all they ever do is take them they take all the bins okay we've got all this everybody separated and we all we do, we all did our little part to try and make the world a little bit better and then all the bins just get dumped into a dumpster yep. all together nothing se- so all the separation meant nothing because it all goes into a dumpster it all gets hauled off to the dump literally none of it is getting recycled and these are from large institutions throughout the city of Ottawa and they know they know what they're doing and the city knows what they're doing, but it's just to make people feel better. I'm like, well, this yeah, is it's, it's, it's smoke and mirrors, it's, but you're not, it really is. Cause they're not recycling any of it. And these are large institutions that produce a ton of waste and it all just gets tossed into a landfill. And I've seen it happen. I'm not making it up. I've seen it happen. And that when I first learned that I was like, like really disheartened by it because I thought, okay, here people are making an effort to do the right thing because people want to do the right thing. Most people want to do the right thing. And if you make it easier for them to do it, it takes minimal amount of effort for me to go, okay, that's the metal, that's the plastic, that's the organic, and that's, that's the trash. This is not recyclable, this product. Okay, I'll do that, no problem. But when I find out that all they're doing is taking it and tossing it all together in the same bin and taking it, hauling it off to a landfill, they're not recycling it was like, well, it's greenwashing to make you feel better, but they're not doing a damn thing to actually improve anything. And that just, it, I felt like somebody was, you know, like when you learn that uh, it's cause it costs there's money. no Santa, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it felt like when I learned for the first time that Santa was not, you know, a real Don't, thing. Don't do not say that on this show. Well, Santa we kids watching. We Santa kids has watching. lots of helpers. But, you know, <laughs> Santa has lots of helpers. And, you know. Yes, but uh, and zero up. emissions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Santa, Santa is carbon is, neutral. Yes. He is carbon neutral. That is true. Hundred yeah, percent. Indeed. Um, reindeer power. Well, and and don't forget they even they create fertilizer because reindeer poop, uh, you know, grows trees and grass. And yeah, but there's a methane wow. issue. Right. Yes. Yeah. yes. We can capture that methane. We can use that to power our cars. <laughs> and set to slay. Keith, what do you think about that? That whole we need to stop eating beef or whatever because methane is is, is that a thing or is it just hype? Like what do you, what do you know about that? Because I've heard that before. I mean so scientists have to that track like what are the different foods and the G yeah. packs, beef is always the highest. Mm-hmm. Um, there's ways to reduce the emissions from beef by adding like seaweed to the food, which I don't entirely understand. Um oh, wow. But I mean, I would say like try and eat less meat. Um, mm. A lot of people go vegetarian. Some people also, some people culturally, it's not going to work. Like particularly, like you know, if you're First Nations, it's an important part of the culture. Yeah. So, but you know, eating less is better. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, t- try it. Like you know, so if pork and chicken are lower than beef in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions mm-hmm. per unit. Um, and yeah, like, and actually you can do some pretty tasty food that, so part of it is also like trying out new stuff, which um, I confess I'm, I tend to be like, you know, like I have peanut butter toast for breakfast every morning. I'm pretty like boring kind of food guy, but you know, like. <laughs> I have it, coffee and you know, five better. cigarettes. <laughs> uh, had a lovely like roast vegetable soup last night, mm. um, but uh, which was you know, really good. So, um, but yeah, it's like, that was the kind of thing, like we encourage people to eat less meat. And I think, you know, for a lot of people just going vegetarian works. Um, but you also got to like, make sure you're still getting everything you need by mm-hmm. vitamin wise, etc. but that's all I possible eat, to do with a vegetarian I eat, diet. I eat mostly wild. Like my freezer is full of elk. Oh, wow. Yeah. And elk is really green. healthy, and good for green. you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wild there's game, no factory is farm. farming. No, no factory. I can't stand that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I pr- pretty much eat wild game. I hunt every year, and I hunt to eat, not hunt for uh, sport. For sport, that that sickens oh. me. The guys yeah. would shoot an animal to put its Mount head on their wall. Yeah. <laughs> like they, 
then you're low GHG. Yeah, definitely. Well, and and don't forget, you gotta gotta get the moose snare set up this weekend, right? I told you, <laughs> I told you about those astronauts in Cold Lake. <laughs> they believe me for a couple minutes, and then one of those Staring guys kind of like, I don't think this is a thing. <laughs> I had a how big would a moose snare be? It was big. It was probably three feet. <laughs> Jeez, I built a moose snare. For the, can these guys believe me that they're gonna snare a moose? <laughs> And they see the billion billion dollar people they send into space. <laughs> One guy was a hunter and he was kind of eyeballing me. And he's like, I don't think that's a thing, but he, he didn't quite know. <laughs> so, can't snare a moose, but I do prefer wild meat over uh domestic beef. I mean, I like I like my beef, don't get me wrong, but I uh, my freezer is full of wild meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And, and as I'm I'm because I have a million food allergies as Bridget's discovered. She's like, I'm going to make this tonight. And I'm like, no, I can't eat that. She goes, well, I'm like, well, here's the stuff I'm not allergic to. The stuff I'm not allergic to is a very short list. And a lot of the things on it, I can't stomach. Like, I don't, I don't feed me beef. <laughs> don't feed me turnip. I don't feed me carrots. I, I don't like them. Although so, carrots. Oh, is, you know, but, is it an allergy thing to root vegetables? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, absolutely. wow. That's bizarre. Raw vegetables. Uh, I, I can't eat raw fruits or raw vegetables. There's like six fruits I can eat, and they're basic blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, raspberries, and uh, gooseberries, I think is the other one. That's about it for fruit that I can eat that I don't react to. Uh, and when it comes to vegetables, I'm allergic to pretty much all of them, uh, except for navy beans, which I don't like. <laughs> so yeah, it's, no it's, very, it's very difficult for me uh, to, to eat like I've, I've had friends you should go to a vegetarian a vegan diet i'm like no I, I i will die i will die i'll starve That's to death because i can't eat it um so it, like it, my diet is is beef go figure tuna i'm not allergic to tuna beef tuna chicken and pork is largely what, what my diet is and potatoes but here's the thing about potatoes i can't even prepare them oh well, potatoes, a lot of ways potatoes Oh no! But it like I I could buy oh, them. Oh, you can't I can prepare them. I can't prepare them. Like I love mashed potatoes. I can't prepare them. I can do a baked potato. That's fine. But if I have to peel them, uh, and cut them up to boil them, my hands break out. My throat starts to. I go into anaphylaxis, and and I'm not making this up. It's happened, and people have seen it happen to me. So you, you drink you know, beer though. Oh yeah, and of course I drink beer. And all right, well you. Build a good Irishman always does drink so. beer. Oh, yeah. This is coffee, by the way. It's not beer. <laughs> oh, it's a little early for beer, but <laughs> beer in a bear cup. Uh, about uh, about the recycling, since we were talking about it, Keith, I know that there's been this movement for manufacturers to basically now take up the recycling, be responsible for the recycling themselves somehow. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how that rules because I'm sure that corporations are not going to be start start having like. Yo play is not going to have its yo play tn specifically come back to the yo play plant where they're going to recycle them there there's got to be some other system that, that that's happening there um how, how is that new system uh, sort of planned to work do you have any insights on that and how is it better than what we have now for things that are not actually going to where they should be going so this is not my area of expertise um we actually have woman named Sarah King who knows all this backwards and forwards. But the basic idea is <clears throat> when you make producers responsible for the cost of dealing with the garbage, they suddenly find ways to make things easier to repair, more durable, and easier to like dismantle, recycle, etc. Um, oddly enough, the design questions like depend on cost. Mm -hmm. And so the Europeans are way ahead of us on this. And so they brought in a bunch of rules on called ex extended producer responsibility. But basically it's like, you make it, it's your problem. And I, okay, again, and story about being old. When I first got married, we like inherited my wife's like family's old VCR from the eighties right. and it lasted forever and it finally died. And at that point we had all these videotapes for our kids. You know, you have like a million of those, like, you know, Disney movies and that kind of stuff. So we wanted to get another VCR, we go in and we're trying to buy another VCR. Well, first of all, I tried to get this one repaired, and the guy was just, just laughed at us. He's like, you know, no one's made a party for this in 1988. <laughs> um, uh, and and the, we're like, so we're buying a new VCR in the like 2006, seven or whatever. Um, and the guy was like, you know, this is only going to last like 18 months to three years tops. 
And I was like, what? This one lasted like 25 years? Yeah, no. <laughs> they like, and that's planned obsolescence, right? Like, you know, they used to build a thing that would last for freaking ever. Right. My parents bought a fridge in 1954. And when we finally, like, that thing finally died because my sister put, she was trying to like get the ice out of the freezer and she put a chisel through the Freon line. No. Um, we dumped it. I was like so happy because I keep, I kept having to move it. And it was like, it was like a, made out of lead. It was one yeah. of those huge old fridges, but it just lasted forever. Now, like we bought a fridge, you know, a few years ago to replace a fridge that died and the things fall, like things are just breaking in it. It's like, it's, but if the companies are responsible for dealing with the problem at the end of life, they like, they don't want to take it back. So they're going to build something that lasts longer. Hmm. And for you and like for all of us, that's good. That's why these types of, this is why you like, if you can get the incentives right, um, rather than expecting companies to build good products going to last for a long time when they're like, why would I build a VCR that's going to last for 20 years when I can build one that lasts for three years and you'll buy a new one every three years. Um, so you're putting an economic incentive on them to like build it right the first time or make it easy to repair. Um, and that is actually really good for the environment. It's good for the bottom line. And, you know, it's, the Europeans have been doing this for a while, so we can basically like just steal a bunch of their stuff. So I don't know all the details on how you do the legislation and that kind of stuff, but, you know, people have done it. And if you've ever gone to like, or had European friends come here, they often look at our stuff and they're like, this is insane. Like, mm -hmm. why do you have all this crap? Um, but there's, you know, like there's big fights happening right now with like Apple um, over right repairability repair. of stuff, right? Because, and the John Deere is like evil. Like how they deal with tractors. Like if someone tries to put a part of repairs it without taking it, they charge a fortune. Mm -hmm. I got pissed off because my stupid printer, oh. I bought like a off-brand printer cartridges and the damn thing locked up. Yeah. <laughs> it's somehow connected to like HP through the internet and it figured out it. I didn't have an HP uh, like, you know, Authorized printer cartridge that cost three times as much. And so like the printer stopped working. Wow. Huh. Like, I buy off-brand printer cartridges for mine and she's good to go. It depends uh, on I, how old I, the printer and the type too, though, because I have yeah. one like that as well, Keith. And same yeah. thing. I buy off-brand, it stops working. Really? Yeah. 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 So I switched. Yeah. To, I bought a we, laser. You a could do a whole show printer. on the evils of computer printers. Oh like, yeah. That would be an entirely separate topic. <laughs> You're right. We could have a whole show on that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically yeah. If you if you make the rules so that it makes sense to make things that can be repaired that are designed to be durable, which is even mm -hmm. better than recycling, right? Both of those things are better than recycling. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of their life can be taken apart and recycled. That is like, that's the sweet spot. So rather than, you know, you and us like carefully, like separating into various box bins, which then get all tossed into the same place. It's like the corp, like the corporations that made the stuff in the first place are responsible for dealing with the problem because they're the ones who can design things better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it puts the responsibility uh, at the right spot, basically, and then gives the incentives yeah. to do that. Okay, interesting. Um, are there um, any other areas that you think that uh, we, where we may, may maybe have the the incentives misaligned? Uh, there's lots of places where we have the incentives all wrong, but I like to me like waste is the big one, like. This whole culture of you know use it once and throw it away as if there's an away there is no away like everything goes somewhere that's basic role, role of ecology you throw it into a landfill it's not like it's disappeared we haven't cast it out into space mm -hmm. um no we gotta turn the moon and... into the next dump just to start sending <laughs> all the garbage to the moon <laughs> yeah uh we could so... create a second moon just of garbage well, it's kind of funny. I mean, we've got so much space junk out there now that it's mm -hmm. starting to cause problems for your new satellites because the stuff ends up floating all around. It doesn't. It doesn't just disappear. Yeah. Um, although some of it falls back to Earth. So, I'd like. You know, for me, also, I think there's a lot of things around transportation where we have the incentives all wrong in terms of, you know, we've designed community cities for private cars. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Again, like I live in Toronto. There's huge battles over just like giving traffic priority to buses and streetcars. You know, you got a vehicle which has like a hundred people on it. Someone who's got a vehicle with one trying to turn left in a place you can't turn left. Um, and it's holding everybody up. 
And this is where, you know, you got to actually design the system so that the incentives are there. So it makes it easier for people to take transit. Um, and you can get where you need to go on time because the transit is reliable. Because that's the other thing is like, if you're like, if it's a crapshoot every morning, the bus right. is going to take 20 minutes, it's going to take 40 minutes, you don't know. Like, that's an incentive to get in your car and drive. Yep. Um, I actually, because I mean, like, I work like five kilometers from my home, so it's not very far. And in rush hour traffic, there's no way you can get to my work faster by car or by transit than I can do it on my bike. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially now that Toronto has actually put in a bunch of decent bike lanes, so it's no longer as death defying as it once was. Right. I've been biking yeah. in Toronto since 1992. It's like a lot better than it used to be. Mm. Um, and you see a lot more people biking because they're separated the bike lanes and yeah. you can do it with greater safety. It's never perfectly safe, but it's a lot greater safety. There are so many more people on the roads. Like it's like you, you basically build the stuff right and people are going to use it because mm -hmm. it works for them. If you're taking your life in your hands, every time you like get on your bike, you're not going to get on your bike. And like my kids don't really bike because I didn't want them. Right. Like, it's just, yeah. Risky, right? Like, so yeah. you, you don't get into that habit. Um, they do, however, understand how the transit system works really well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's good because I'm a big proponent of public transit, and I'm happy to see that we we keep expanding on our public transit here in Ottawa. And I know the Toronto, well, the Eglinton Crosstown, which has been under construction for 100 years, I think. Oh, <laughs> Deliver the damn baby. Like, good lord. <laughs> but... Um, it's unfortunate that when Rob Ford became mayor, he killed the transit city uh, design that they have because it was a really good design. It was. Oh, yeah. And he just killed it outright. And I'm like, dude, you're, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. What is going on? And what does his brother want to do as premier? Build the new highway that... Who actually wants this highway? There are people who want it, guaranteed. There's always somebody who wants it. But here's the thing. Most of them are developers who want to build and develop along that way to make generate more profit for themselves. How many people are really going to use that highway? There's no infrastructure in the area he wants to build it. He wants to build it through the green belt. It's like this is it's not needed. Build more transit, expand the the subway, expand go, expand on what we have instead of you know, if you build another road, if you build it, they will come. You add more lanes, you widen the highway, it gets more cars. It's as simple as that. It's been proven time and time again. Case in point, like you just said, because they're building proper bike lane infrastructure, people are using it and more people are using it. If you build it, they will come. I, uh, the, I used to work for a group called the Toronto Environmental Alliance, which is a local municipal group. I worked there six, seven years. And we were like involved in Transit City. When that plan went down, it was like, it was a very sad day in my life because it mm -hmm. was a lot of time gone. Um, but like one of the, like one of the reasons the Eglinton Crosstown is taking so long is because under pressure, um, rather than putting it, you know, on the street and taking away lane traffic from cars, there's a decision to bury the thing. So it's going underground for like the main part of the downtown area. Right. And that is incredibly disruptive and hard and expensive. It makes it so much more expensive to bury the thing rather than, you know, take like on St. Clair, I live near St. Clair, basically it took away the middle lane of traffic. It's just for streetcars now. The streetcar gets you where you need to go fast. It's predictable, it's rely reliable. Um, you can still move around by car, um, but there was a decision to take that lane of traffic away. And it just meant you could build the thing fast. It was so much cheaper, mm -hmm. it's working. But in Eglinton, there's a decision to bury it. And that's just put the cost through the roof. Because you just, anytime you try and like bury something in a city, like in a downtown core, for that long, it's going to be messy, right? Like, right. and you're going to, like, you're down there and you're like, oh, look, 200 years ago, somebody like built something here. That yeah. No one knows about because <laughs> no one kept records. Um, you find burial sites, uh, things like that. Uh, they they discovered a, a burial site um, when they were digging the tunnel here in downtown Ottawa for the LIT. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we didn't know about this before. They discovered old train tracks where they built the new train tracks that were underground. I'm like, what is this? Oh, th and this was the turning circle. And over here was train tracks they had built that went from a brewery to the warehouse. So they would move the beer into the warehouse and then put it on trucks from there. It's like, nobody knew about these things. <laughs> oh. Yep. So they just like buried them. And then when they started to 
build the hole to put uh, the part of the old train that went through the downtown coordinator. They, they just found that stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeez. Nobody knew about it. Yeah. Nobody well, that, knew anything the, about it. Yeah, but you're right. The, those are the, it's, uh, it's like any home renovation project, right? You get your estimate until they, until they put a hole in the wall and go, oh, we didn't expect to find this here. Well, that's got to cost you more. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, right. in any project of any type of infrastructure, it's like, you know, we, we go in with a budget. This is, and it's a projection. And there's always small things. And sometimes in the case of Ottawa, big things like when the, there was a, a, a sinkhole right on Rideau Street. Yep. And some poor guy who's had, he's a locksmith. He had his minivan, Dodge Grand Caravan, full of all his tools and locks and keys and key cutters. Well, that fell into the hole. And what did they do? They filled it with cement. And they were pouring 24 hours a day for like four, three or four days straight. And a friend of mine who works for one of the companies that did a lot of that work said, we couldn't get enough people to, to get there. Because they had to, I mean, it's a major thoroughfare in the city. It's right downtown. It's it's a, a stone's throw from Chateau Laurier. So they had to fix it as quickly as possible. And also, you know, I'm worried about things collapsing because it was flooding. Is it going to affect the tunnel underneath? Because the tunnel ran right under the street there. You know, so little things like that. And here's the best part. I had met a woman who was a geologist. And when they did the soil samples, they had predicted, they said, most likely we will see a sinkhole during construction and it's probably in this general and they were not far off at all they they had predicted that this was going to happen so there was actually part of the budget to absorb that but it's never enough because it's still an unforeseeable even though you've projected this could happen it's still an unforeseeable and there's only so much you know we might have a sinkhole okay but how big is it going to be how damaging is it going to be what is it going to cost to repair that is an unknown and that happens in times like that so when they start major infrastructure projects you are going to discover things that you can do all your due diligence all your projections all your modeling all your budgeting and still be way off it's just a simple fact of the matter yeah. and the eglinton crosstown is an example of that now myself i i much prefer uh if if we can have because our lrt is just tunneled through the downtown core and then it comes out and it's but the problem in Ottawa is we, we have this thing called um, snow and occasionally freezing rain. And it seems every time that happens, the train stops running. <laughs> and it happens way too often. So I'm like, let's just bury the damn thing, like put it underground. And, and when they did the tunnel here, they didn't use uh, tunnel boring machines. They, they didn't use like a round tunnel boring machine. They just had, had uh, uh, basically drilling equipment and dynamite equipment. Uh, so they were blasting and drilling and it took, they, 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 it didn't take forever to get the, the tunnel drilled, but it did take a little bit longer and they had to go a little bit deeper in places because, you know, they, oh, that's, 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 we're here in bedrock here. This is going to be expensive. But if we just move it a little bit or go a little bit lower, we can get into the clay area or up or you know how that works but the problem is then you've got a tunnel that's going like this which as you know steel wheels on rails don't don't like to go uphill no they don't grip well um and, and the uh, the new section that they're building out in the west end a section of it uh from tunney's pasture is in a trench and then it goes from trench to at grade uh, for a little bit along the Ottawa River, and then it's going to, in, in a, uh, they're doing a cut and cover tunnel. But the cut and cover tunnel is uh, in a grassy area. It goes under the street, and, and then after that, it enters into what is known as a linear park. So they're doing a cut and cover in the linear park. The park will be res- uh, uh, renewed once, once the uh, system is operational. But the stations, they're going to be open air so it's tunneled until you get to the station they'll have the surface mount and then it's all open air in a trench i'm like what why are the station should be a cover if the if the if the main part of the system is covered why is the station not covered because ottawa has crazy climate insanely hot in the in the summer usually insanely cold in the winter this year being the exception because i think it's going to 15 degrees here today in march 15th beware the ides of march that's today uh, so I don't understand why they're doing that. And, and the East end is built between the highway in the median, which I think is ridiculous because people fail to realize that in the winter when, you know, the salt is down and there's a snowfall, 
that's going to get thrown onto the tracks, which is detrimental to the train. <laughs> like, I don't know who planned this. It's just so ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so if you were talking, for example, if uh, municipalities um, were looking to put in better mass transit, what are some of the things that you think should be uh, looked at in this case? Uh, so, like, I actually think Transit City was a good model where it was a lot of light rail above ground um, and can move a lot of people quickly, mm -hmm. reliably, um, and actually really low pollution because it's electric. Um, yes. The, you know, again, like, but it depends. It's really hard to, Transit's one of those things that it's hard to say, you know, what's the standard because it looks really different in different places. Right. Um, like I grew up in Ottawa, then my parents moved out to Canada. Like Canada was, yeah, weird, um, weird, <laughs> very weird. I grew up in Ottawa as well. Canada, yeah. Um, but like, so why? Like, you know, like what's going to work in Burlington looks very different from what's going to work in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Um, but it's you basically want to design a system that gets people, you know, where they need to go reasonably quickly at a reasonable price and. The that requires stable funding. Um, it has to be viewed as as like public infrastructure. I mean, we think nothing of paying a fortune for roads and highways, mm -hmm. um, but then like for private cars. Um, so people in their cars think like they aren't, you know, transit is publicly subsidized. Cars aren't where it's like, well, your yeah. car doesn't go very far <laughs> unless someone has like put in all the roads and this traffic signals and is policing it. Like there's a huge amount of money that goes into that as well. Right. Um, and it's also a challenge. So it's like you also have to like shift urban planning to allow greater density because transit works better where there's density. And I think there's actually like a significant push almost across the political spectrum for that right now, at least recognizing we need to sort of build up existing communities rather than just sprawl. Although Doug Ford being an exception, he really wants to keep sprawling. Yeah. Um, but it's fascinating that he's managed to like be been beaten back three times on the green belt. Right. Um, He's lost three times, like trying to hand that over that eight billion dollar gift to his developer buddies, and um, so it's these things are not inevitable. We can actually like try and resist them, uh, but I do think that combination of affordable housing with mass transit that works for people is going to be like. If, I think if a political party can get that right, then they can actually do well on that because that's a big thing for people's concerns. Um, and if you do it right, you also are making it a lot better for the climate because we don't have people like commuting vast distances every day mm -hmm. in, probably in single occupancy vehicles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned something that's of interest to me because when you mentioned the Green Belt and how, you know, um, there's a combination of good journalism that's that helped to that, to, to Doug Ford backing down. But, and I'm guessing the strategies would be different for urban areas and rural areas. But if you are living somewhere and maybe you want to speak to both urban and rural and you see a project and you're having concerns for the environment so for example the the highway 413 that's going to go through you know prime agricultural land uh what they're doing at, uh, at ontario place for example where they're just ripping out a whole bunch of trees um first that you know and maybe a whole lot more than is really needed in order to be able to uh, to do that. Uh, somebody wants to build something somewhere, and they're just going to clear cut rather than you know strategically cut or something. Um, what are things that people can do if they want to uh, try and encourage the government to make a better decision? Yeah, I think the tricky thing here is we actually have to you know. We have a long tradition of saying no to bad projects. Greenpeace, that's we're very you said. The challenge right now is we also have to be able to say yes to good projects, particularly on housing and things like you know increasing density. That can be tough because a lot of times people they love their na particular neighbor, they don't want that character to change. You know, I get it, but on the other hand, we kind of need to build up those areas. So there has been some amazing work done by like particularly the narwhal which is like a three-person operation in ontario um, <laughs> denise balkasun uh, fatima sayed and um emma mackintosh 
um, mm -hmm. together with the Toronto Star. Like we've actually seen collaborations between like a nonprofit journalistic outlet with the Toronto Star, the biggest paper in the country, um, to expose a lot of those problems, which have helped really drive that. But it's also been, you know, community opposition. And I think, you know, the 413 is one of those projects we need to stop. Like, and I think the federal government can play a role in that because they actually have some tools there to stop these types of bad projects. Because the 413 is just like, it's an excuse for sprawl. It's like a gift to developers. Um, provincially, the NDP was saying, well, why don't we just try and move some of the trucks onto the 407? Because there's a, you know, mostly right. empty highway there, right? Already, like, why not? If you're concerned about traffic. Um, but if we're going to say no to the 413, which we should, because it's a terrible idea, you know, the primary agricultural land is going to increase sprawl. It's going to embed all those things, which we don't want to see anymore. And once you build, because, you know, when you build infrastructure, it's around for 40, 50 years. Right. You got to make sure you, when you make those decisions, you, you do it right because it's really expensive to kind of go back and revise. Um, but we've also got to get like, like I, okay, I'm sitting Dufferin and Dupont in Toronto. When I walk my dog in the morning, I see like two cranes kind of like over that way, and there's two cranes that way, and there's a couple that way. There's like a lot of construction happening. Right. The density, like the the shopping mall that's a 10 minute walk from my house um, is being completely rebuilt with like four massive towers. Um, and it's going to have, you know, tens of thousands of people. Like those are the kinds of develop projects, which are, are good. And I, you right. know, like some of my neighbors were not that keen on it because, you know, it's, this is a relatively low density little section, but we need to start supporting those projects as well. You know, we, and we're going to have to put on more buses because, you know, once you have, you know, extra few yes. tens of thousands of people move in, you got to like be able to move them right. down to the subway. Um, but it's like that's, yeah, none of these things are easy uh, because it's, you know, the, but definitely like on things like blocking the Greenbelt projects. The key thing there has actually, one of the things I think the provincial liberal government did here well in the kind of like 2008 period was when they established the green belt, they did a lot of consultation. They got a lot of community buy-in. They also established a green belt foundation, okay. which basically has spent years sort of like making sure people love the green belt and making, because by connecting people to it, right. So that they have that connection, they sort of see the value. And so like a lot of the opposition to the sort of attempt to intrude into the green belt didn't come like it wasn't just downtown Toronto. It was actually 90 mayors in the 905. Right. We're saying no, like, you know, Hamilton was saying like, well, you know, we'll build up like, you know, like let's, mm -hmm. we'll build up our community rather than sprawling more. Um, and that was a pretty potent pushback on the conservatives. I think that's why they, they flinched because, and then also, you know, with the help of the Narwhal and the star sort of, and other media outlets sort of showing like, okay, who's really benefiting from this? You know, is this who who is this really good for? Oh, it's good for like a few people who all happen to have shown up at Doug Ford's daughter's stag and doe with envelopes of cash. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, the quid pro quo. So <laughs> <laughs> it looks that way. Yeah. Um, mm. But the you know the the opposition to that was sort of built at a community level because people had that connection to the green belt. They wanted to protect it. Um, but we need to sort of also build that up for supporting those good projects, which is also true on like the energy front. We need to like have that support for wind and solar projects because, you know, change is always challenging, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have to change a lot of things to be able to keep what we have because the choice right now is no longer change or no change that it's either change we do to avoid climate change through better transit, different energy system, or the changes that come from all of the things that climate change will exacerbate, the extreme weather, the wildfires. You know, it's not like change or no change. It's what kind of change. Change is coming like regardless. Right. Yeah, 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 it's happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not a, you know, we, you know, you always say like, the status quo is not an option. Literally, in this case, like physically, in terms of physics and chemistry, it is not an option. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and it's a, we can choose like, what kind of, we have some influence over what kinds of changes and that's what we have to do what's best for you know people and nature because those are actually aligned right now when it comes to climate
<laughs> actually, you know what? When you framed it that way, that's the way I've never heard it framed before, actually. And I think that's particularly effective my backgrounds in communications. And, you know, change is coming one way or another. Choose your change. Right. Is it, yes, so you know, like this, your neighborhood changes because a forest, uh, you know, a fire went wild and raised the whole neighborhood. That's a change. Or it's changed because, you know what, you decided to, you know, densify and, you know, bring in more public transit and bring in better building codes and, you know, change the way that we recycle and have a better, uh, you know, better climate incentives for better choices and whatnot. And, you know, we're changing the, the cars that we drive and driving, you know, riding bikes more and making better food choices. And, you know, the hundreds of little decisions that, that all add up, every jot and tittle adds to the mm -hmm. pot, as we say, that, that you all made to, but change is coming one way or another, regardless. And, you know, do you just want, life to just happen to you or do you want to you know try to have some say in what's going on in your life yeah so john holdren who was science advisor to obama in his first term he gave this speech which really stuck with me which where he said okay look we're going to do three things about climate change there's only three things we can do and there's the three things that we are going to do to varying degrees we can try and reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that mm. the planet doesn't warm as fast as quickly right we can try and adapt to like changes that we can't avoid. Although some changes you can't adapt to, um, you know, and that can be things like, you know, making sure that the forest doesn't go right up to the neighborhoods anymore. So that if there's wildfires, it doesn't get burned down, having different rules. So the roof doesn't, your roof doesn't blow off in stronger storms, um, better flood water controls, all those types of things. So you can like reduce greenhouse gas emissions, adapt to some of the changes, and that's usually the debate. But what are we going to do? Those two things. Mm -hmm. The third thing we can do is we can suffer. Hmm. Because if the less we do of number one and number two, is actually a choice to maximize number three suffering. Right. That's the actual policy option here. And so when I get to come back to that Polyev rally, like right. when I showed up there, it's like. The, the choice to not talk about this, to not allow anyone to talk about it, is actually a choice to maximize suffering. That is the choice that is actually being made here. Mm -hmm. And that is unacceptable to me and I think to a lot of Canadians. Mm -hmm. I agree. But it's not being presented that way. No. Hmm. Interesting. That's a good, that's a good thought to leave this on. Um, Keith, um, thank you so very much for taking some time to join us today to just uh, to, uh, speak about your experience and uh, give us some insights into uh, what we should be looking for in terms of a you know, better climate policy in order to make a better informed decision when it comes time to cast our votes. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been fun. Yes. And uh, if ever uh, you have uh, something that uh, comes up in the in the news or a topic that you, you think that our audience should know, please know that you're welcome here anytime. Anytime, sir. We would love to have you back. All right. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. My Take best care. to your family. Right. And uh, Kits, of course, as you may have noticed uh, over the course of the chat, uh, Army Chris had to, uh, to punch out. So uh, thank you to him also for having uh, joined us today uh, I love, to talk I love, a little bit. I love Fridays when we can get a few people in to come and chat with us, right? Because it, it, it really moves the conversation forward. And we all learn something as a result. I mean, I learned a few things today that I didn't know before. And, and my goal is to try and learn something new each and every day of my life. I'm pretty successful at it, surprisingly, despite what many people would think. I'm actually pretty successful at learning something new every day because I want to, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Mr. Grizzly, I think we have a show. I believe we do, sir. You, you gotta, Do you uh, have a couple of things you need to attend to today? Uh, no, no, not specifically. Oh, okay. I was, just, I was just curious. Just curious. Not specifically. Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah, I just... There are other things I could talk about, but it just seems to be a little bit of a, a weird transition based on what we've done so far today. Okay, no, fair enough. I understand. Yeah, so let's we'll just put a bow on it for now, and 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 we can uh, visit some things on Monday. And don't forget, folks, tomorrow we will be having a virtual podcast, uh, our monthly podcast, but it'll be a virtual one tomorrow because it's the day before St. Patrick's, so every pub in town is going to be a zoo. 
<laughs> so yeah, it'll be a virtual podcast. Uh, I'm going to kick things off probably around three thirty, quarter to four ish. Mr. Beaver will join in shortly thereafter. Uh, we've got a few guests that have we've lined up to to join us for the day to to have a chat and maybe raise a, a pint of Guinness and and cheer uh, the feast of St. Patrick, as I like to call it. And uh, yeah, so that's tomorrow around three forty five, four o'clock ish ish. I'm going to go into the pub, shoot a little bit of footage, and have a pint of Guinness, you know, because. St. Patrick's, you got to do it. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have a good afternoon. We'll have a good afternoon. All right. Good stuff. Um, I guess a couple of uh, things I could briefly mention sure. um, because they were big deals, but we didn't get to touch on them. Um, two of uh, the two employees that uh, work with uh, GC Strategies have been called uh, to the house to testify. They testified oh. over the past two days. Uh, Christian Firth is the first one. Um, the second one's last name is Anderson. I can't remember. Darren Anthony, sorry, uh, both came in. Um, Darren Anthony's testimony was the less interesting one of the two because his claims are basically that, you know, he handed some administrative stuff, but not that much else uh, with regard to the project. Uh, Christian Firth was a, a lot more combative. Mm. Uh, with uh, regard to that, uh, having accused uh, the work of the committee and uh, certain um, MPs who are... There's a bit of this that's reminding me a lot of uh, what happened with We Charity, how uh, basically they destroyed a good charitable organization. Yes. Um, you know, not a perfect one, of course. There were always issues. Of course. Uh, but a good organization that was doing good work just for the sport of it. And it seems that something like this might be going on here, too. Um, Christian Firth had complained that, you know, he's received death threats and has needed additional mm -hmm. security and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they've frozen his ability to be able to get new contracts, which, of course, you know, while this is going off. on, yeah, uh, makes it difficult for them uh, to do uh, their business. Um, and, and, and let's... Let's let's even though there's a lot of money involved, it is a small business. Yep. So and and, and what happened to the small business when Pierre Polyev doesn't like it? He works to destroy you. Remember the donut gate? Yes, or the the brewery. The brewery, the donut gate. I, I like Yeah. I don't uh, know how, I don't know how else to paint the picture of this man will destroy you if it will benefit him. Mm -hmm. Now, both of them had, uh, this committee had been trying to get both of them to appear for uh, a good long while. Uh, they refused invitations twice, once in November, once in February, citing concerns for their mental health. I'm guessing that if they are getting th death threats and they have a whole section of the government, uh, and when I say the government in this sense, um, I don't mean just the, the party in power, I mean everybody in parliament. Mm because the entire function of government. Uh, they have one party uh, within the government um, dedicating the full weight of the resources of the state to trying to malign and destroy their reputation. That would cause uh, people to have a couple of uh, mental health anxieties. Oh, yeah. Issues to go on. Um, so they twice refused, which is why uh, the group had uh, passed that... Uh, agreement in committee that if they didn't show up this time, they would uh, issue a warrant. Uh, both of them have appear, appeared through video and not in person uh, to testify uh, over these uh, past two days. Uh, remember that uh, the Auditor General of Care Canada, Karen Hogan, said in a report that she could not figure out how or why it was that GC Strategies was retained to do the work, nor could she find it uh, or identify which government official had actually chosen the company, given the lack of documentation there. Mm. Um, Christian Firth made the point that uh, from their perspective, GC status, Strategies' perspective, that all the documentation was there and filed, and that the, the issue might be more with uh, government record-keeping, in this case, CBSA record-keeping, not the Prime Minister's office, or overall Government of Canada record-keeping. There seems to be some issues at CBSA specifically with the manner in which that contract has been managed and with the manner in which they have kept documentation, which was not up to standard. Mm -hmm. If we are to believe the Auditor General, then we have no reason to not. Um, so there's some work that needs to be done there. But that's... Um, 
that's a public servant issue. Yes. That's a public service issue. That's not a government issue. And I know that everything, you know, the buck stops at the government and the buck stops with the minister and that type of stuff and that matters. But that is, uh, you know, once you get to that level of departmental work if receipts are not uh, being kept the same way and uh, right way or documentation is not being kept the right way, um, that's a couple steps removed from the people for whom we vote. Specifically, you know, it doesn't mean that they don't have ultimate responsibility and don't have need to look into that and establish changes, but you can't necessarily also say that it's their fault. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not like the green belt thing where the decision was brought right into the minister's office and they hired a specific staffer to do that specific thing in such a way that they could say, Hey, we didn't see anything. This is, you know, the government system that already existed and the contract was being managed by a government department and was managed by a unit in that department. There was something in that unit that made it such that records were not properly kept. Um, so there definitely needs to be some work that's done. That's done there. But uh, so you, you got to put the blame where it, where it lies at some point. Um, uh, there was also a claim that uh, $19 billion was received by GC Strategies to do that. Firth said that it was more like $11 billion. And uh, the other eight possibly being remuneration for other work it was doing on other projects at the time. Um, they have also received uh, three other contracts, I believe, since... Um, according to reports on uh, CBC, but it seems that right now uh, they have been barred or blocked uh, from getting more contracts. Interesting. And uh, Firth accused members on the committee of saying out loud that he was a fraudster and uh, encouraged all departments to refer matters that, that the committee had, uh, basically the conservatives on the committee, but the committee itself, tried to get all government departments with which GC Strategies had done business to refer all their activities to the RCMP in order to get an investigation going because there is an investigation going in, uh, RCMP investigation into, uh, I believe, GC and into the unit itself at the CBSA where, where this was done. Again, not an investigation into the government itself, but into the governance of this specific program um and it seems that um at committee uh when firth decided to take this opportunity to turn the tables on them and uh, bring their behavior to light um his questioners did not take too kindly at all to having their motives challenged by the witness but of course they had no problem challenging the motives of the witness trying to depict them as someone who's a uh, committed fraud and have been doing this for a long time in the press, even trying to frame him as being a criminal with by issuing that warrant for him to appear. So, um, and it seems that uh, some of the members of the committee uh, are now trying to say that Firth was evasive, and they're trying to uh, use again, once again, the full power of the weight, uh, the full power of the weight of the state, to find him specifically in contempt of Parliament. Well. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, uh, who's telling the truth here? Of course, we do not know because we don't have the documentation. We don't have access to it, but it uh, does seem that we do have a member of the business community saying, Hey, you know, you guys are pretty much setting me up for a fall here, which we would normally first have doubts about the veracity of such a claim, mm -hmm. much like, you know, the person, as we talked about uh, yesterday, we we're talking about the use of performance enhancing drugs where people turn around and go, no, no, it wasn't me. Somebody must have spiked my drink. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if we had not had the Ben Johnson and Lance Armstrong incidents, you know, we'd be more inclined to believe that. But now there's a whole section of people that go, yeah, yeah, they always deny that they did it at first. And then a couple of years later, oh, well, yeah, yeah you caught me. So, it's that type of attitude here going on with this. You know, maybe we would be a little more inclined to believe you, Conservative Party of Canada, that the problem is actually with the contractor, except uh, you just pulled that we thing on us and, well, and then the SNC Lavalin thing on us that you tried to make us believe was criminal and technically wasn't. And so, you know. There's only so many times that you can run to a microphone and saying uh, this person is a criminal 
mm-hmm. to various different people, oh, yeah. and they're ultimately not being any investigations or charges or whatnot before people start thinking, oh, yeah, everyone's a criminal to you, and roll your eyes. <laughs> uh, the boy who cried wolf, basically. Yeah, exactly. And let's remember the story of the boy who cried wolf is eventually there was indeed a wolf. And yeah, nobody was listening. It's not that there wasn't a wolf. My good God, my dog farts a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Lola. You, oh my God, Jesus. 80-pound pup. Come here, sweetheart. Sorry. That's... Right. Um, I'm... I don't want to regulate what's happening in the chat, but it would be really nice if we got off the Dina and Joe conversation. Yeah. It was just, can we just put that to bed, please? We're not going to agree. No. So let's just leave. Clearly. Yeah. So wait, we can just respectfully disagree. Yeah. Look, this, it's, it's, uh, it surfaces just way too often and makes the chat environment unpleasant for everyone else who has to watch it. And we don't want that. Like this, you know, where we want to create an environment where everybody can come and we can hug it out at the end. It's, uh, you know, and we're talking about environmental stuff here. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not like just uh, if you have your side and if you have your friends and you have your cause and you believe in it, the, that that's great and whatnot. But it doesn't, you know, this, um, you know, constant like having to butt heads and um, you know making fellow kits uh, that are here. Uh, trying to be the uh, framing them as the bad guy mm-hmm. or, or the bad girl uh, in this. There are people that are going to believe what they believe about Karima, regardless of what the truth are. There are people that are going to believe what they want about Dina, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. regardless of the truth. There are people that are going to believe things about certain kits who have had run ins, either positive or negative, mm-hmm. with any of these people involved, regardless. Your personal experiences with these people are true and real for you. Yes. And uh, I don't think it's the place of others to have opinions on the personal experiences of others. If one person's experience of someone is negative, they are allowed to have that and they should not be considered a bad person for saying it. If one person's experience with someone that someone else had a bad experience with is positive, they're not a bad person for having said that as well. Um, but the constant circulating and coming back to the same issue and never getting any resolve because there will be no resolution. Your experience was positive. Your experience was negative. Mm -hmm. And that's okay that you both had two different experiences of the same person. Um, If I have a negative experience with someone and somebody says my experience of them was good, the fact that their experience of them was good is not going to change my opinion on my experience of them. Exactly. I'll be happy for you that your experience with them was good, but mine was still negative. And there's no amount of back and forth that's going to change either of our opinions on that. So those are the types of things where we can actually say, let's agree to disagree about what we think about this person or what move we think on. about this movement and move on uh, to, in order to be able to make room for other discussions and not just always having to rehash uh, the same ones all over again. Um, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's like, um, uh, we're trying to create a little space in our chat, you know, where we can exchange our ideas and our experience and our thoughts and, uh, for other people to recognize them as valid, even though that's not necessarily true for them. So if we can, try to have the conversation in that way and uh, maybe even i know it's a lot to ask but if we can take that spirit of uh, honoring honoring or at least honoring if not honoring but acknowledging as being true for you your experience um out into the broader world uh that would be great because i sometimes see this conversation continue offline in forums that are not this one um, where I see people that I care about Mm -hmm. on both sides 
of this. Um, doing things to each other and saying things about each other in other forms, that could be kinder. Let's put it that way. Could be kinder. Um, and um, I, I just don't want to create uh, an environment here where we're bringing stuff from the outside. And uh, as yes, Kit Cassie's saying here, it's uncomfortable for those of us in the chat that aren't privy to the outside arguments and want to chat about the topic of the show. And uh, we would like to, uh, you know, have this, you know, it's okay to have history with people, right? It's okay to have history with organizations. But like I said, our personal experiences are ours and we share them and, you know, and it should be that. It's like, you know, wow, I'm sorry you've had that experience. You know, like this, I recognize you've had that experience. Mine was different. Oh, okay, well, yours is different. I'm glad you had that different experience. And that's really where it should end uh, at that point because there's really nothing to be gained of trying to convince uh, someone who's had a bad experience or someone who's had a good experience that the person that they've had that experience with is the complete opposite of the experience they've had of them. It's, it's just not going to happen. It, it doesn't work. It go. It goes nowhere. All right. Um, so just uh, not an admonishment, but more like a gentle encouragement mm. on our part uh, to try to create, uh, keep this one little corner on the web where we can uh, be civil. Well, not 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 just civil. Just uh, because I, I I'm pretty sure we're being civil. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that um, at some point there's nothing more to be gained right? by having the conversation over and over again. And um, the people who are active in this way are going to continue being active and we are going to be able uh, to be able, uh, we're going to have to talk about these incidents and the people involved with them as things progress during time and I don't want to necessarily create a situation where every mention of them or something connected to something to them becomes an invitation or a pretext to have the same old conversation all over again right. exactly to, to get on the hamster wheel the, the, the hamster wheel um, so just um, I think we all know where we stand when it comes to to this particular thing and uh, we should just uh, honor everyone's uh, experience with it acknowledge it as being it real for them and um, we you know there's there's nothing to be gained in convincing someone that their experience of someone else is wrong mm -hmm. there 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 just isn't and that's regardless of what side of it you're on regardless of what side you're, you're on, uh, which is one of the reasons why I often talk about, you know, um, approving of tactics and strategies as opposed to approving of people. Right, right. Right, because um, we all make wise and less than wise decisions uh, in that, it, that which is important to us and what we want to pursue. And, um, you know, and even if we make a wise decision, it could still be viewed by someone who's equally well-meaning and who cares about the issue just as much as being unwise because it's something they would not have done or they would not have chosen for themselves. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's illegitimate, right? Just because you wouldn't have chosen it for yourself or oh, that's something I wouldn't have done doesn't mean it's something that was wrong to do. It just means it's something that you wouldn't have done, right? It's, it's not... Uh, your internal hardwire, hardwiring doesn't work that way. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong if somebody else's does. So um, if we were all the same, we would get tired of talking to each other because we'd be very, very bored. <laughs> so let's, let, let's just try to uh, uh, you know, share our personal experiences, acknowledge that everybody's had the experience, and if we agree to disagree respectfully, then we hug it out at the end of the show. That would be absolutely fantastic, and uh, we would love that. But uh, the more we can keep uh, the conversation uh, in the chat, um, 
related to the topics that uh, we are discussing here on the show, or of course, whatever else that you do want to describe, uh, talk to, talk about it here in the chat. It doesn't strictly have to be that, but the more we can keep it to it, because you know it gives us something to us too. You know, we get to pick from that and bring it into the episode and get our guests when we have them to respond to that. Or sometimes it gives us thoughts about stuff that we forgot that we can uh, add in uh, to a. Uh, improve the content and the, the quality and the, the amount of information that we're giving uh, because you do contribute to the show a lot kits and we really do appreciate it and uh, it's uh, it, well it, it makes me happy that you care enough about the show yes like this to want to be able to contribute uh, things that are material uh, to it and uh, things that we can and things that we don't know because we're only two of us and we can't read and see everything and you know we rely on you a lot to, to bring us uh, to check our blind spots for us as well and and we're going to make mistakes because we're only yeah having... yeah so just uh just uh like you said you know we talk about be kind to and gentle with yourselves uh, let's do that in the chat as well right um Works and i'm me. sure i'm sure that um how would I put it? On chat, it's all written, right? So you don't have the benefit of tone. Mm -hmm. You don't have the benefit of inflection. Uh, and There's whatever no it is that you, you are coming lost. Exactly. And whatever it is that you're showing up with, like if, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes before coming onto the show, you had a bad experience, something else, that will make it more likely that if you're reading something that doesn't have any tone or inflection, we're reading it with darker colored glasses rather than rosier colored glasses. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, what do you mean by that? And it's like, and that might not have been intended. So one of the things that I ask people is to not first assume the worst of others. And if there's something that you're reading on the chat, somebody, some, something somebody's saying that, uh, that's maybe taking, you're, you're maybe taking it the wrong way, maybe to first assume that maybe the intent was not to have said it in the wrong way. And uh, the question, um, I don't understand what you mean. Could you please reformulate it? Or could you please explain what you meant by that? <clears throat> is a valid question, as opposed to assuming. Take, take some time to check that uh, somebody actually intended to be uh, offending. Um, because sometimes we just take shortcuts when we write. There are certain words that we, we leave out. Uh, more diplomatic the pleasantries and um, you know and, and, and things get missed and then we first assume things about the intent of others that weren't there in the first place so um, some of these conversations are probably better had in person or at least voice to voice so you can have the benefit uh, of all the color and texture uh, that goes with language that gets uh, that disappears from it when you are uh, are just doing it uh, on text. Um, you know, Kit, James, and I have that issue often. This where when we're just writing to each other, that um, it's like, so I was like, why are you being so surly? It's like, just like I'm not being surly. I thought we were having a great conversation. It was like, oh, I'm uh, I'm perceiving you as being surly. <laughs> it's like, well, no, I wasn't being surly at all. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, but we respond to what we what we perceive, and not necessarily sometimes what was actually intended. So um, take some time to check in uh, with the person that you're writing to uh, to be sure that uh, you know we're not uh, misassuming on on intent as well. Well, somebody earlier in the chat uh, from a paired channel from somewhere I don't know where just started to, <laughs> and I'm like, bald much? What kind of shampoo do you use, Paul? I'm like, are, are you trying to make fun of me because? We're all well aware that I shave my head. Yeah, but that's like the yeah, but like if it's someone that you don't know, you don't have a track record with. It's like okay, is this good natured ribbon? Yeah, are and you just, I, are, are you just busting my balls, or I, I are you trying to get off. at me? Are you trying to goad me? Are you trying? But it could be taken both ways. And again, you know, if you come like yesterday when you came in with a migraine, maybe yesterday uh, you would you just would not be having it. Mm. But today you're in a better mood and oh, somebody's just busting my balls. And it doesn't bother me. I know I'm bald. I shave my head. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> it's what you what you bring what 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 you bring to the party matters. <laughs> so um yeah. Like I said, just more of a gentle nudge 
uh, an incentive uh, towards uh, wanting to create a space where we can have that uh, fulsome discussion. Okay, uh, because you know you are the best damn fam in all the podcasting, and you know I'm a I'm a little selfish. I want to keep you all here. Mm. I don't want anybody feeling that they have to go away because you know they feel that the chat is not a welcoming environment. All right. So uh, as somebody pre- uh, said one day on the chat, new rule, after every show, we hug it out. Yes. Here on the chat. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't go to bed on an argument. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially don't do that. Yeah, that's not good. Um, there's other things going on in the world, as we uh, mentioned as well. Uh, you know, there's that thing of ripe can. There's stuff going on in Haiti. Um, that's what, a, and the government's involved with that. I have a short video clip I think you might like of the Prime Minister talking to um, union labor. Oh, okay. Let's do uh, that. Let's, let's take a look at this because I think it's... Well, let's just watch and then we'll move on. <laughs> oh, now it won't play. <laughs> <laughs> Try and reboot it one more time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Kit, uh, Kit uh, Aina makes a, a great comment here. I think we also need to keep in mind neural diversity as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a very, very good point. I'm glad you raised it. It, it, it you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, your expression for those of us, you know, I have ADHD, uh, which I, I think is defined as neurodiversity. Why does this thing keep defaulting to this? Ina, sorry, Ina. Sorry, Ina. Ina. Yeah. Uh, we have an Ina who contributes to the show. We have an Ina, and I keep on mixing up your names. I'm so sorry. Yeah, there's two. Yeah. Sorry about that. Let's try this video clip again. I think it's going to work this time. Hang on. Here we go. Oh, for Christ's sake. Tech will not cooperate. It, All right. It, it's on the Twitter. So, it, uh, Elon, get your shit together. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, that's probably our cue then, Mr. Yeah, Wesley. So. Let's consider so. this a show. Nice. Kits and Cubs, uh, we hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us because word of mouth is priceless. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Let's try that again. You do not have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, the fabulous, fierce, and fiery Ray Girl, who has sponsored our pod page. So if you scan that QR code that is underneath my chin or use the lovely digits on your fingers or your voice prompt, lovely digits on your fingers, lovely digits on your hands, or use her voice prompt. <laughs> I don't know how to segue out of dad mode. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. Uh, you could go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words, and that will bring you to our pod page site. And if you subscribe there, when we have fresh, something fresh off of the bat, fresh off the bandwidth, it will come directly to you. If you'd like to support us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube t- channel where you can click like, share, and subscribe. And uh, that way, um, you help us a lot. And uh, yesterday, we had asked people to help us as we get to uh, 675 a week. And I know that when we started the show, we were at 674. So uh, thank you so very much. And Hopefully that will continue and we will uh, meet our goal of uh, reaching 700 before the end of next week. So uh, please tell everyone about us. And if you would like to help us in other ways, uh, the QR code that's appearing right by Mr. Grizzly's head over there, well, that brings you to our coffee page where you will find the emergency hydration fund here at the Beaver Lodge where you can contribute to making sure that uh, we have staff that can help us make that show. Uh, Guinness, hot chocolate, coffee, and Caesar are all waiting for us, and uh, they deserve a raise. So, um, <laughs> because they have been definitely making sure that we put out uh, some uh, decent product for you. So, if you can make a little contribution there, we would appreciate that. Everything that you uh, donate to us is very much 
very much cherished and appreciated. But as always, like we say, the gift we cherish most is the gift of your attention. If you would like to write to us, true north eager beaver at gmail.com. And if you happen to be listening to us on Apple uh, Podcasts, uh, reviews and stars are greatly appreciated. Also, uh, for those of us who listen to us on Google Podcasts, it seems that uh, that service is going to be discontinued relatively soon as well. So please make plans to migrate to another platform when you have the opportunity to make sure that uh, you do not miss out on our offerings. Because democracy is something that you do, please write those letters to your MPs, your MPPs, your senators, and to your media. Uh, in the spirit of the show, uh, ask for more complete coverage on what is going on with regard to climate. So, for example, hey, stop uh, talking about uh, the climate regulatory fee uh, without talking about the rebate. Stop referring to it as a tax when it's a regulatory fee. Uh, talk to us about the counterfactual, that if we're not doing this, if we're not putting money into a carbon regulation, then what happens? Uh, how could that cost us otherwise? And uh, other things of the sort, uh, or just basically explaining how it is that, you know, charging uh, a carbon regulatory fee to raise the price of certain things actually contributes when it comes to consumer behavior to people making better choices. All these discussions are important, and they a lot of them get evacuated from the general discussion in order to get to the shortcuts or the soundbite or the sensational uh, bit of the day. So uh, if you want more responsible reporting, you need to ask for them. You need to know that, uh, let them know that you're paying attention and that you notice that it's not there and that you would like it. So please write to those letters. It really, really, really does matter, and they do make a difference. They very much do. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your Eagle Beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom for us, please? Oh, I think Mr. Grizzly took his uh, ears out. So um, we're just wondering, Mr. Grizzly, if you had some words of wisdom for the kids before we go. Sorry, in a meeting. Ah. All right, uh, I'm going to guess that that's a no in that case. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in a meeting. Um, I might have to stretch a little bit uh, until Mr. Grizzly uh, is able to get uh, the phones back in so that we can end the show. So um, since we are doing that, do I need to stretch Mr. Grizzly? It seems I do. Okay. So uh, I will do that then. <laughs> Sorry, kids. It's a, I'm not sticking the dismount today. Uh, but since we have some time to talk about other news, um, we'll talk a little bit then uh, about uh, what's going on in Haiti. Um, gangs in Haiti have seized control of the airport. And it was all with uh, an effort to get, get the current president, Ariel Henry, to resign. Gangs had also seized control of about 80% of the capital, Port-au-Prince, and have been creating pretty much a state of anarchy for about 11 or 12 days now, uh, attacking police and government infrastructure, leaving hundreds of people dead, injured, or kidnapped. Uh, Ariel Henry, uh, the recently... Uh, I guess, or soon to be resigned president, took over three years ago after the former president was assassinated. I think it was Jovenel Moise was his name. And um, he had fled to Puerto Rico uh, over the past few while, uh, past a few days, in an effort to try to seek international help with the situation. He had negotiated a thousand strong police force uh, that would be arriving from Kenya to try and help with that. It seems that there were some delays with regard to that or some thought that it might not go, th go through. Uh, it seems that the Secretary of State of the United States, uh, Mr. Blinken, has had talks with Kenyan officials to try to make sure to keep that initiative um, going. Uh, the leader of the gangs, uh, some guy that goes by uh, the nickname Barbecue, uh, has seemed to have made a commitment that uh, the gangs there would express, uh, more than express, uh, but would uh, oppose violently any intervention or international intervention to try and reestablish order, uh, anything that was not organic coming from the people. And um, 
that's one of the situations in Haiti, uh, unfortunately, has been for the longest time. The, the people of Haiti have not been allowed to choose their own leader. There's always been some type of interference or influence from a foreign country somewhere. Uh, the people in the capital and throughout the nation are desperate for food and water. Um, officials have, uh, through from many countries, have been meeting in Jamaica over the past week. Uh, Canadian officials have been there, uh, that they've uh, been taking part of an emergency uh, in an emergency meeting that was called by the pre Irfan Ali, who's the president of Guyana. Uh, Bob Ray, who was our ambassador to the UN, uh, had gone to those meetings and was trying to help there, joining uh, leaders from the United States, France, and many other Caribbean nations. Um, the installed president, um, Ariel Henry has announced that he would resign if a transitional presidential council could be struck in uh, such a way as to elect a new president. It seems to be that there's some objection from the gangs uh, ruling the island nation at the moment uh, with regard to that as well. Uh, they're particularly not keen on the, that type of initiative. Uh, and um, according to Bo, the fifth column, who we, uh, well, we listen to a lot and take a lot of information from, it seems that uh, the most important thing the international community could do for Haiti at this time is to indeed allow them to actually choose their next leader from a slate of candidates that is also of their own choosing and to do so freely. Uh, the United States uh, has sent in some Marines to get non-essential staff out of its embassy. I believe Canada Everybody's has been uh, pulled. Everybody has Even been essential. Pulling, yeah, has been pulling staff uh, from the embassy as well. Um, so I'm not quite exactly sure um, what the resolution is going to be there and uh, how we get out of that situation because the gangs do very much seem to be in control of the country and there just seem to be a pretty much total state of anarchy at the moment. Uh, but the current situation also can't be allowed to persist. So uh, I'm not smart enough to know what the solution is. There are much brighter minds than me out there trying to figure it out. And uh, so far they seem to be uh, pretty much at a loss as well. Mm. All right, Mr. Grizzly, uh, if you're not in a meeting and you do have words of wisdom, that would be great. If not, I, I'm blank. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to solve a technical issue here at the same time. Uh, no worries. Work, no so worries. I'm, I'm just drawing a blank. <laughs> Sorry. Then, kids, I will wish you uh, have a wonderful weekend. And uh, my words of wisdom would be take some time this weekend to do something for yourself that brings you joy. Words Doesn't have to be you. expensive, just has to be something that brings you joy. Connect with your sense of joy. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the rooster. Try and. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Right. And uh, before we go, um, still wishing good luck to all the people competing at the Ontario Senior Curling Championships. Uh, Kit, uh, Michael, um, uh, give me a little bit of an update uh, the other day. And uh, our local team, after three matches, were at the top of the leaderboard at a 3-0 and record. Mm -hmm. So go Team Heron. Uh, and of course, this weekend in Sydney, Nova Scotia, uh, please tune on your TV sets at some moment and uh, cheer for Team Homan, Team Canada, 
at the World Women's Curling Championships, uh, bringing a stellar performance at the National Championships where she went in 8-0 in the, the round robin and won all the playoff matches. So I think it was 11 wins in a row in order to uh, get the title. And uh, let's hope they bring that uh, winning streak to the World Championships and that uh, we come home with some hardware, preferably gold. Cool. But any hardware will do because mm-hmm. there's some stiff competition. And But the most important part is to have fun. Yes. All yeah. right. Let's see if have I can a great try weekend, this. everyone. I think this is going to work this time. Okay. I'm going to try it one more time. One last time. One more time. Unions have always been at the heart of how we built this country. Right on. And they will continue to be. But you know how hard you've had to fight for it over decades and generations. You know how much you've had to push on this. For the past eight years, you have had a government that has been on your side, that understands that the fight that you have is not just for yourselves, but it's for Canada. And that's why I'm so glad to be here today to say thank you to all of you for everything you've done in this fight and to charge you up for the continued fights, not just over the coming years, but over the coming decades, as every day we position ourselves to make Canada a better place for all of us here now and for future generations. Unions have always... I thought that was uh, pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And the people there seem to be rather receptive to it. Yeah. Go figure. And, 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 And... this government has shown that they are actually on the side of unions. Yes, they are walking the talk because they, they have really not are. connected back to work legislation. They've allowed things to negotiate um, at to the negotiate bargaining table. table. Yeah. Like this. And uh, our current minister, Seamus O'Regan, uh, almost every time he's asked, are you going to force them back to work? Looks at people like they're insane. Yeah, he's like, no, we're not doing that. That, that would diminish the, 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 the bargaining power of the union. No, we're not doing that. I'm like... They actually are walking the talk. Yep. That's something that we rarely ever see from any politician of any stripe. So, you know, you can hate the man as much as you want for whatever reason, but at least have a valid one. And don't say, well, I don't like his socks or the blackface thing or whatever. Don't do any of that. Hmm. Hate him for his policies. And then tell me how his policies have harmed you. And I'll be waiting a long time to hear that. All right. Have a smashing weekend, kids. We'll see you tomorrow Good persistence, around 4 p.m. Good persistence. Thank you. <laughs> see you tomorrow.